with more meat than they can take. Today again, one such woman came to the station. We've all gathered here to watch the vision learn and get inspired from some of the sharper women celebrating Mother's Day in Delhi. Women who were responsible for shaping the different paradigm of India in the recent past and are currently setting global benchmarks to the Indian ecosystem for the years to come. It is, a rare, it is rare to have such celebrated exponents of science converge into a single spot, but it is even rarer to have them think, talk, and act science in complete synchronicity. All of this is being uh, made possible through the tremendous initiative, the Dr. V.K. Saraswat Endowment Lecture Series, and uh, we at Graphic Era, with the customary tradition of honoring science before anything else, wholeheartedly welcome our esteemed guests for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, please, <laughs> big round of applause for all our esteemed guests. Not dragging this further, let me invite on stage, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Kamal Granthala, Honorable Chairman Graphic Era Group of Institutions, so that we can invite our guests to share the stage with him formally while welcoming them officially as well. First and foremost, the man of the hour, the man of the ages. Uh, if I can have Dr. V.K. Saraswat, Honorable Member Niti Aayog and Chancellor JNU come on stage. Customary welcome, Ms. Ramsa, please. I request Dr. Saraswa to take his uh, spot on the stage. Next, I'd also request on stage. Uh, Mr. P.K. Pandey, uh, come over and please uh, take his stage. He's the advisor, Belkin USA, former director, Global Engineering College to Aerospace, and the secretary for CIS India Science. We have an eminent scientist amongst us today, a man of great faith and great repute. If I may please take the privilege of welcoming on stage Dr. Sushir Mishra. <laughs> Distinguished scientist, former CEO and MD Brahmos Aerospace. Let me also welcome uh, one of our key speakers for the day and uh, a very senior position holder in the world of uh, the best manufacturing and automotive manufacturing. Please help me welcome on stage Dr. Krishnan Sargopal, Senior Vice President Ashok Leland Chen. Uh, I'd also request Chairman Sir to uh, take his spot on the stage now, while I also take the uh, privilege to invite on stage uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Graphicada University, Professor Narbinder Singh. If I can have you on stage, Professor Narbinder Singh, if I can have you on stage. I'd also request Honorable Vice Chancellor Graphicada Hill University, Professor Sanjay Sukula to come on stage, please. Request Professor 
our pillar to step forward and uh, officially help us to welcome in our guests who are not on the stage right now, but we'd also want to officially welcome them before we uh, connect with the with the uh, with the lecture. Um, if I can have on stage first, um, Dr. P. Shanmugam, uh, scientist from CLRI Chennai, please here. Please, if I can have you on stage, sir, I'd request Professor Narbinder to officially welcome Dr. Shanmugam. Uh, next, if I may request <coughs> Dr. Venkat S. Iyengar, Principal Scientist, LA, NAL Bangalore, to come on stage and grace us with his presence. Again, I'd request Professor Narbinder to please uh, welcome him officially. A little bigger round of applause, Mr. Pete, please. Invite next Professor Dr. Sudarshan Kumar, Head of Department Aerospace Engineering at IIT Bombay. Again, Professor Narpinder, this is your request. All right, sir has just reminded me that he is now the ex SOD, he has just completed his tenure as the head sir. request Professor Sanjay Jasola to step forward in welcoming our upcoming guests, please. If I may invite on stage Professor S. A. Channiwala, former professor and head department of mechanical engineering at SAFC and IT Sura. Let's keep the applause going, ladies and gentlemen. have on stage Professor E. Borpatham, Director, Department of Automotive Engineering, VIT Bangalore. Thank you so much, sir. Um, can I have Dr. V. Ramanujachari, fellow CSIR, former director DRDO, IIT Madras Innovation Center, on stage, please. Dr. V. Ramanujachari. Last but not the least, let me uh, call on stage Professor R. V. Ravi Krishna, Professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering, IISC Bangalore. Without wasting further much time, I'd request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Graphic Arrangal University, Professor Sanjay Jasola, to take on the mic and uh, address the gathering a bit about 
what should I be doing? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Distinguished guests of today's event, Dr. V.K. Saraswat Ji, Member Niti Aayog, Chancellor Jawaharlal Nehru University, the Distinguished Scientist, Secretary Department of Defense, and person who is known as a missile man of the country, uh, starting from Prithvi to Agni 5 are to his credit. And uh, yesterday, I, sir, I was going through your uh, profile and uh, I saw that you are not only related to defense, but you are there with IOCL as the chairman of their uh, <laughs> research council with railways and I saw that you are in, you, uh, you guide people uh, on microprocessors, developing microprocessors to IoT and what not. Professor Dr. Sudhir Mishraji, the former Director General of DRDO and the CEO of, CEO and MD of Brahmos Aerospace a distinguished scientist, our very own Professor Kamal Ganchalaji, a uh, visionary entrepreneur and philanthropist, Mr. Krishnan Sadgopanji, Senior Vice President of Ashok Leyland, and what I heard of, uh, heard about him is that any diesel engine cannot be passed without his clearance. So this is his authority. <laughs> Mr. P.K. Pandeji, the person who has actually brought the galaxy of people in the campus, the secretary of CIS, our uh, distinguished vice chancellor who features as one person among, he features among the top 1% of food scientists in the world. Uh, I can see the, the very, very senior professors from IITs, ISC, and other places. Our pro chancellor, Professor J. Kumarji, the vice chancellors, co vice chancellors, my faculty members, uh, distinguished guests. Dear students, so first of all, it's, it's an honor and privilege to welcome you all in this VK Saras, Dr. V.K. Saraswat Endowment Lecture. Sir Aditya has given me a responsibility to tell us, to tell everyone about Graphic Era. Graphic Era has been in existence for last 30 years and it's very, very difficult to summarize a 30 years journey in five minutes or maybe seven minutes. So I'll try to see how much. <laughs> so my boss says that it has to be only five minutes. Sir, five minutes is not possible. What you have achieved, what you have, you have led a team which has done wonders. So I'll start with that. So yes. So, <clears throat> so you are most welcome to Graphic Era a brand name which, which has two universities, four campuses, a medical college, a global school. And the journey of Graphic Era started in 1993 by a young boy who graduated with an engineering degree and instead of working for somebody, he thought of serving the people. He had no money. He borrowed 29,000 rupees. And from that 29,000, he bought a computer. And because he was carrying knowledge with him, the skill set he was having, so he started imparting training on different aspects related to computers, drawing, and AutoCAD, what not. So if a person comes for learning perhaps Fortran or Pascal, he will teach Pascal. If somebody comes for C, he will teach C. 
somebody comes to learn autocad he'll teach autocad and from part of that drawing room he moved out of his house and uh, he came to a smaller room then to a bigger room and in 1997 he came to this campus the campus on the other side where in yes in 2000 so in 1997 uh, we uh, he created an institution called graphic era institute of technology and we started with only two courses bc and bmit later on we added different courses in 2000 we started mca in 2001 onwards we started different engineering courses and the focus the word q used to define us and the focus was on quality and to maintain that quality he used to take classes and you all will be surprised to know that even today he takes classes post this program he has slated his class 12 o'clock he is going to take the class i think it deserves yes it deserves huge round of applause and in 2008 in 2006 we were nba accredited in 2008 the graphic era institute of technology became graphic era deemed to be university in 2011 he thought of starting yet another university and that was graphic era hill university and this is where i would like to tell you the attributes of a leader on 28th of april the legislature passed the bill of establishing a university with three campuses this was april and he he decided that we will have the classes running from 16th of august the very next very next the, the the same year we will start the classes we were not having land we were not having infrastructure we were not having anything and the herculean task of establishing two campuses he achieved in 4 months and sir in bhimtal we were not having land we were not having building we were not we were not having anything and in 4 months we could achieve this so hats off to his leadership and we are really fortunate to have been working with him and sir then in 2015 we were given grade a by by nac the score was 3.23 which was high uh, highest at that time at least for 36 different university which has gone for uh, nac accreditation at that time in 2018 we were given uh, regular deemed to be university status 2019 onwards because by that time the government of india had started a ranking framework so we started applying for uh, ranking and in 2019 we were the we were ranked among the top engineering institution in this region we also got uh, i gaze diamond ranking by by qs and from 2020 we have been making it in the top 100 universities of the country so <laughs> you may remember that 2020 was the time when we all were down with corona and we were sitting most of us were sitting at our homes and this is yet another reason for a leader to come out and he thought of starting a new campus in haldwan again people were inside their homes he ventured and he came out we searched land and we developed a campus and again the campus sir if i am not wrong it was it was within 120 days we made that we were not having land we were not having anything but this is his power he can mobilize resources and do wonders so we created third campus of graphic era hill university in 2020 2021 onwards we have been uh, ranked among uh, again top 100 universities and in 2021 we started a hospital called graphic era institute of medical sciences 
in 2022 last year we were ranked among top 75 universities we also ranked in a band of 601 to 800 universities by times higher education and we were there in 301 to 400 rank in engineering by uh, by times higher education this is our graphic era university campus and you can see that at the backdrop we are having rajaji national park you can see lush green uh, forests and so we talk of air quality index especially because people who live in delhi they talk of air quality index as 300 400 and sir we have kept all these measuring instrument in this building there the air quality index is it varies from 30 to 40 30 to 40 then we have another university this university where we are we can change yeah so this is graphic era hill university dehradun campus where we are uh, sitting right now yes we can move forward this is yet another campus and people told us we used to feel that this is very beautiful campus but in 2017 we came to know that we came to know that this is the 11th most beautiful campus in the country <laughs> sir i'll share only one thing if you see on the right side there is uh, there are two buildings two round buildings you can see a thick forest there so there is a thick forest on the private property so one fine day when boss was there in the campus he realized that this is outside our boundary this does not belong to us and because of or in the name of development people will start constructing houses there and this green forest will not exist so the very first thing he did is he bought all that land and said that this forest will always be preserved and sir jara ek minute piche le aao there is another story related to these three trees on this open air theater you can see that there are three trees three trees they were they were in the middle of the campus and everybody wanted to cut these tree three trees so boss said no we will not cut it and we will continue with this and then we maintained those three trees and he designed this open air theater and now those three trees are the backdrop for this open air theater <laughs> so sir 5 minute mein to nahi ho payega sir ye isse aage chal le we I'll, i'll rush okay so this is yet another campus uh, which was established during corona we can move forward yeah aage aage yeah so we are we are in the top 100 university for the fourth time this time we have improved our ranking this becomes 55 now in the university 62 in engineering 65 in uh, management and we are ranked in 51 to 100 in the innovation ranking uh this is the times higher education ranking now again for 601 and 301 this time we have been ranked among top 10 institutions top 10 universities in the in the country yeah the <laughs> these are these are the seven courses that are accredited by nba again uh, move forward yeah uh we are in nac a plus now kolkit you can be fast Uh, sir these are the placements which we are having you can see that our highest placement is 84 lakh then 56 then 49 and at amazon we have multiple numbers not one or two the 5 4 at morgan stanley you can see 5 at g scalar 8 and the number count is this is a package more than 15 lakh below 10 lakh below 15 there are multiple they are in hundreds uh, sir we also have a dsc 
to sponsor technology business incubator. Uh, there are 40 plus startup which have taken place. I'll share, I'll only talk of these three. Uh, the first one is by a boy called Rajat Jain who was a mechanical engineering student. He made this world's smallest ECG machine and said this is of the size of this. And yesterday I was talking to him. He said that now you don't even require this. You only require those three leads and a mobile and your ECG will be there available on you. Uh, there is another startup. Uh, See, my students, they have done wonders and I need to tell. Uh, this is this is student, uh, this company was the only company which was uh, funded by all sharks. There are five sharks and each one of them, they funded him. Uh, then they, this is another set of a student, uh, Manas and Avinash. They have made uh, a company called D-Town Robotics and they make huge drones. And these drones are being used by paramilitary forces, army, and Uttarakhand government is also planning to have it. Then there is one more boy who have uh, developed a kit for identifying the adulteration in the milk. Now we can move. Uh, so this is what, no, 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 okay, so, <laughs> yes, we need to, uh, so we are working on innovation and you can see that our faculty members, the students, they have written 6,199 research publications. Uh, there is a, there are projects and consultancies which are being done by our faculty members worth 65, 35 crores. We have got 800 patents published, 70 patents granted. And this year, this number is going to be uh, at least doubling, yes. Come to next. Uh, so this is another feat our faculty members they achieved. Uh, this is the invention that has been done by our faculty members of life sciences, they have been able to develop a RT-PCR based typhoid kit. And I was going through uh, a news item there few days back. The company Vanguard is now uh, developing, uh, is making more than one lakh kits which will be distributed at different places. So this is something which our faculty members they have done and this is, uh, there is no RT-PCR based typhoid kit. Yeah. Uh, this is our hospital, uh, state-of-the-art hospital. I think there is no sink. Yeah, okay, so we have seen it. We can skip that. And we have this global school which is now coming up. We'll be shifting, the kids will be shifting in July in this uh, graphic era global school. Yes, that's all. So this is Gregor Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, without further ado, let me ask our triple chairman and graphic group of institutions, Professor Kamal Ganchala, for his welcome address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This gives me immense pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. V.K. Srivastava Padam Bhusan, Honorable Member, Niti Ayo, Scientific Advisor, DRDO, Ministry of Defense, Government of India, Chancellor, JNU, and former Secretary, Research and Development, Department of Defense, Government of India. It is a rare privilege to host an event of this, this status, we are honored to have Dr. Sarswat amongst us. His presence and words of wisdom shall be a great source of inspiration and motivate for the, uh, motivate for the inmates of entire graphic era. I also extend my sincere welcome to Dr. Sudhir Kumar Misra, CEO and Managing Director, Brahmos Aerospace, 
outstanding scientist and former director general drdo mr sad sadgopan krishnan senior vice president asoka leland limited and independent director indian oil corporation limited i also welcome other dignities on behalf of graphic era i like to say few words about dr v k saraswat see yesterday uh, i got a chance to meet him and uh, see his research is a very wide spread research he started from missiles and in missiles also prithvi missile and then uh, brahmos and then he was instrumental in clearing of light combat aircraft tejas project and he was instrumental in clearing of submarine ins arihant development project now he is instrumental in developing alternate energy systems and uh, he is also bringing reforms in indian railway by setting up a indian railway research institute so that's what i said wide spread and yesterday i got an opportunity to meet him and if you ask me to describe him in few words so i'll say modesty humility humbleness patriotism and above all a man with golden heart so if you ask me while giving his introduction today i was bit nervous also normally it does not happen with me but let me tell you that in my 30 years of working i never met a person like him so this is a great opportunity to all of us to meet him to interact with him to listen him and aditya was telling that he emits energy so he is emitting immense energy so you just have to catch it and i like to request him that his blessings he should keep on blessing this graphicara group of institutions and now onwards we become his extended family members so may god bless him may god give him best of the health jai hind thank you so much sir amongst all the things that we are here to learn today uh, one very important lesson that at last speech teaches us is that your admiration uh, your uh, the expression of that admiration when it's genuine it speaks for itself and uh, we could feel that you meant every word that you said sir thank you so much for those heartwarming words and sir we cannot describe dr saraswat how how much of an honor it is for us to have you here on stage ladies and gentlemen please a big round of applause again for dr vk saraswat to be here keeping the session moving i request professor narpinder singh honorable vice chancellor graphic era university uh, before i do that i'm so sorry sir i'll have to uh, call on stage uh, mr pk pande uh, the secretary for cias to officially uh, take over the program from cias standpoint thank you, thank you so much so again i don't want to introduce everyone because everyone has been introduced and I, even though i have I mean, listed all the names, and but I would like to say just the dignity on the dais and uh, my council of executive committee members from Commerce Institute, uh, students and faculties. 
so it's a very uh, great honor to be here. To be honest with you, all of us feel very proud that we are getting associated with such a wonderful institute. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, to be again honest with you, that we were not really knowing about what the graphic era university, and we are really, really seeing that it's a gem in Hyderabad. I mean, a gem in Dehradun. So you know, we should. Keep in mind that this is the campus we should always remember in our heart and mind and we would love to come again here. Such a wonderful campus and uh, air quality index 35, I think, <laughs> 35 and 40. I don't think that I have, I have heard this. This is looking something like a fake news what I see in the WhatsApp. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a like a sounding something fake news what I see in, in the you know, WhatsApp, but it's real, I understand, it's real. Uh, so I uh, just, uh, all of you must be knowing about what is combustion, uh, all of you like uh, might have heard that uh, combustion institute, but you don't know what the combustion institute is all about, right? So just I would like to give you a bit of, uh, maybe a couple of minutes about combustion institute and then what is uh, endowment lecture. Because I must know the background before you really get into the real business. So combustion institute uh, is CI, you can go and just type combustion institute in Google and you will find all the information. So this is an international body. Uh, it was founded in 1954 in uh, Pittsburgh, US. And it so happened that there were a lot of science and technology were developing that time in US. And uh, like combustion was the one of the stream in science and technology. But when they started realizing that combustion is not just a, a stream of science and technology, but it is the I mean, a stream. It it high to get a, like its place uh, in the in the forum. So they decided uh, in US they decided to set up a, a different institute called Combustion Institute, and that came out from the like a like a history of all science and technology. They said it had to come out as an independent body. So this became an independent body, and it's uh, now expanding. It has got now 36 branches in 36 country. And Indian section is one among them. Uh, India joined formally in 1974. Uh, even though 54 it was founded, but we joined in 74. So that's the history of Combustion Institute. Combustion Institute, uh, uh, India is called Combustion Institute Indian Section, CIIS. So wherever you see CIIS, that logo. Uh, 54 is not our year, it is the Combustion Institute International logo, and that's what all over the world wherever we have the combustion institute, we follow the same logo. Even though different institutes in the world was formed or founded in different point of time, like we got introduced in 74. Since then, we are doing a lot of activities uh, under combustion institute, like in national and international uh, in, uh, conferences, seminars, biennial uh, conference, which we call National uh, Conference on IC Engine and Combustion. We had one in Dehradun, it was 2015, 2015 in Dehradun in uh, UPS. And we are now, after seeing the campus, we are really tempted to have one here in this campus. Uh, so one of this uh, activity of Combustion Institute internationally called Traveling Fellowship uh, Lecture. So what is that, the Louis Bernard was the first chairman of Combustion Institute International in US 54. And in his honor, there is a traveling fellowship uh, lecture in US. So every country is giving a different name uh, around this, and we are having that invited talk uh, under different name. So if you look at the Combustion Institute Indian section, even though it was founded in 74 and jo we joined in 74, but the actual uh, the boast of combustion institute where we are visible today and we, s we proudly say that like you know we are the member of combustion institute this all happened after Dr. Saskar took over as a chairman and you can see the so much has been spoken about him so much uh, I mean you can see him almost every day on TV every day on TV everywhere in you know government forums and that uh, speaks about him so when he became the chairman of combustion institute Indian section, since then we are just going like a rocket upward. <laughs> so when so when we decided to have the very similar of like a traveling lecture, whatever they have in US in different countries, we decided to give the name the endowment lecture and in his honor we said that it will be named 
to make sure that we never, the, this uh, four of the Tomboshi Institute, even after 100 years, they don't forget Dr. V.K. Salkar. The way U.S. don't want to forget Louis Bernard, the Indian section then want to forget Dr. Saswat. And that's where we gave the name <laughs> Dr. V.K. Saswat in Norman Lecture. That even after 100 years, this Norman Lecture will continue. 2013, we had the first uh, lecture in, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, Professor Mukunda from Minnesota Science, head of department that time aerospace, he came and delivered the first lecture. And since then, we have been doing this almost like every year, at least once, but uh, sometimes twice. And we are very happy to be here uh, for the same lecture today. So, so this is the one about the Norman lecture, the history and where we are today. And we have got two very prominent speakers, our good friend, uh, Dr. Misra, and then we have got uh, Krishnan Sadagopan, and you will be hearing a lot about uh, what they are doing and what type of science and technology we have in our country. So that will be very nice to hear for all of us. I'd like to just tell only one more thing before I conclude that Combustion Institute is not only about the endowment lecture. We also do a lot of other activities. For example, the first time the Asia Pacific Conference, which was like a Asia Pacific Forum, uh, we did in 2010 here. And we were supposed to get uh, one in 25. Uh, we really bid it, but it so happened that Singapore got into the loop and they wanted to introduce one more country and they said, let Singapore take 25. And 27, we'll be having the Asia Pacific Conference on combustion in IIT Mumbai. And we have our friend, Dr. Uh, Sudarshan Kumar. Uh, he was HOD for just uh, till you know, recently. He's going to be the organizing secretary for uh, Asia Pacific Conference, what is going to happen in 27 in India. It's not easy to get. It always gets like a five year and 10 year in cycle. You can't say that I'll be having next year. You have to get into the loop and say that after four years, or after six years, we got 2010 after trying for six years. So six years we tried, then we got 2010. Now we are trying, now when we'll be getting in 27. So that is how it happens, that is going to happen here. So with this, I would like to thank the, the whole uh, management of Graphic Sera and especially you, sir, for thank you so much uh, for you know, giving this opportunity here for all of us to come and see a beautiful campus. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, everyone here knows very clearly that this has been made possible because of the Combustion Institute organizing this jointly with Graphic Era. So big round of applause for uh, their efforts, please. Right, so this is all a fanboy moment for me personally. I've been an avid follower of the aerospace space since my childhood and uh, ever always wanted to be an aer aerospace engineer, but uh, time took its own course and we ended up doing computer science. Um, uh, we, uh, I personally, uh, since I told you it's a fanboy moment for me, uh, I also want the younger ones to realize uh, what you are here for and uh, the kind of stature you're dealing with. But uh, the personality here in reference is so big that I'd request uh, somebody of uh, a senior stature from our end to introduce him to you. I'd request Professor Narpinder Singh, uh, Honorable Chanc Vice Chancellor Graphic at Deemed, Deemed University to come here and please uh, help us introduce the big and illustrious profile of Professor Saraswat. A very good morning, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Sarpachi, Professor Kamal Ghansala Ji, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Sudhir Mishra Ji, Mr. Krishnan, my friends, distinguished scientists from different uh, institutions, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to introduce a highly decorated, distinguished scientist of the country who is the former Director General of DRDO and Chief Scientific Advisor to the Ministry of Defense. He retired in 2003 after imparting government service for more than 
2013, okay, uh, after imparting the services for more than 40 years. And he's presently Niti Yog, that is earlier the planning commission, is the member of that and uh, chancellor of very reputed university, Joharlal Nehru in Delhi. He earned his master degree from Indian Institute of Science and doctor degree from Osmania University. And gentlemen, you will be surprised to know that he has been on, awarded honorary degrees, doctor degrees, by 25 universities. And the last was by Jamia Hamdard in 2018. Uh, he remained for runner in developing the number of critical missiles technologies. And he's the key scientist credited with the development of Prithvi, Dhanush, Prahar, and Agni 5. So he has, has already been mentioned at Mizil, you know, the man with a golden heart. Already uh, we have met him. He's a very humble. He's fellow of many national academies, like uh, National Academy of Engineering and Astronautical Society of India, Institute of Engineers. And he's member of the governing council of Samir member of Board of Research of AICT, CSIR Labs. He is chairman of the Convention Institute, uh, Indian section, and Aeronautical Society of India, Hyderabad. He is a recipient of many awards from the DRDO, and the first award he got in 1987, and then he got another award from National Aeronautical Prize in 1993, DRDO Technology Transfer Award in 1996, Performance Excellence Award in 1999. For his outstanding contribution to the nation, he was awarded the highest honor of Padam Shri and Padam Bhushan by the government of India. As member of Niti Ayo, he initiated a number of programs and uh, for example, to develop methanol economy for transportation, energy generation and production of chemicals, fertilizers, and production of, uh, you know, the petrol refineries. And he has brought number of technologies and number of common platforms to lead the methanol economy. M15, gasoline blend, methanol cook stove, methanol fueled propulsions for inland waterways and methanol fueled gensets are being introduced as part of the methanol economy and all was initiated by him. He has been conferred with the highest honor and let us, uh, you know, uh, we are all are eagerly uh, waiting to uh, listen and uh, let us again welcome and give a give applause. So, sir. Thank you very much. We are honored to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. There's a lot to tell about the man. I'm sure it can't be fit into such a small. Uh, for the for the for the uh, for the students here, he was he is the man. Just to quick reference, he is the man who gave who brought the initial operational clearance to what we know as the LCA Tejas today, and also for India's first nuclear submarine, Arihant. So with that idea, <laughs> if that doesn't give you an idea of the stature, nothing will. Let me, without any further ado, please invite on the mic, uh, Chairman of CIS, Member of Niti Aayog, and the Chancellor for JNU, a special guest, Dr. V.K. Saraswat. Good morning, Namaskar, Dr. Kamal, 
the chancellor and the promoter of this great university, the vice chancellor, other vice chancellor, all my colleagues from Combustion Institute, the faculty members of uh, Graf Kira Hills University, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me an immense pleasure to be part of uh, today's event. At the onset, I would like to thank profusely Dr. Kamal for two things. Number one, for giving such an elaborate and from the heart introduction of mine. Number two, for giving us the opportunity to come to Grafikira for having this uh, event organized. In fact, when uh, Dr. Pandey mentioned to me that we are going to Dehradun again, I was reluctant to give him my assent. I said, no, we have gone to Dehradun a number of times. Why are you repeating? Because I was under the impression that he was taking me to UPS again. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I think we have come to the right place. I'm really impressed by the kind of vision, the kind of dynamism, the kind of initiative, the kind of, you know, major steps which have been taken by Dr. Kamal from the early days of 1993 after graduating to bring an institution of this class which is now benefiting thousands of students in different fields of engineering sciences. I think it's a rare story. I think such people only make the world today. And Dr. Kamal is one among them. I have heard the story of uh, Ford. I have studied, I have heard the story of, uh, you know, the Apple man and all that, you know, those who started. I think Dr. Kamal is nowhere less than many of those people. <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about uh, our Commercial Institute. I'll give you the story of mine as far as how I landed up in combustion. When I was doing post-graduation in Indian Institute of Science, I wanted to join in aeronautical department, but uh, because of the process of selection, I was given IC engines, internal combustion engines. I did not get admission in the aeronautics. But Dr. Dhawan at that time, who was the director, has started a new system that you have to do only certain number of institution credits. And after that, you have the freedom to go to any department and take any course. That kind of a flexibility started only in 1970. Before that, it was not so. It was a very rigid system. So having got IC engines, the core courses, I also took some courses in aeronautics. So it became a blend of aeronautics and IC engines. But one element which was common was the science of propulsion. Here we were doing IC engines for propulsion. We were, we were being taught aircraft engines also. And there we were also being taught science of propulsion. We were again aircraft engine, rocket engines, satellites. Everything was being taught. So that gave me the nice platform to become a propulsion man. And uh, after completing one and a half years, when the time came for doing a project, we had four options. Take a project on IC engines where you will do some evaluation of the IC engines for different parameters. Then there was a professor of mine, Dr. Venkatesh. Unfortunately, he's no more. Uh, he said, please come and take a project on lubrication and we are in IC engines. There was another one who said the automobile, because IC engines also had the automobile component. He said, why don't you take some automobile project designing? And then I had my favorite uh, professor at that time, Professor Kupurao. I think you may be remembering him. Uh, we used to play badminton together in IRC. So he said, why don't you work on combustion? So I spent about a week with him and he introduced me to the science of combustion. 
And science of combustion is multidisciplinary. It is quite different from other distinct areas. Here you need chemistry, chemical engineering, kinetics, physics, chemistry, and everything about uh, fuels and things like that, the energy release mechanisms. So I was really, really affected by the intricacies of that science. And I said, I should be doing work in this area. So from an engineer who was a mechanical engineer who was also learning propulsion, I started picking up the fundamentals of combustion. And my project became droplet combustion, studies of the droplets when they go into the combustion chamber of a propulsion system, whether it is pro rocket propulsion or IC engine or any other kind of a furnace where the fuel is injected for burning. The whole process of starting from injecting a liquid fuel or a gaseous fuel, converting into droplets and from those droplets, then evaporating and convert, getting converted into high temperature gases and increase in pressure and then go through the thermodynamic cycle of expansion, compression and expansion. So the entire process became like that. That was the, that six months of work which I did on droplet combustion at that time. Of course, at that time, the work was on ambient conditions. But by the time I submitted my thesis, I was, in, I was uh, introduced into high pressure droplet combustion. And that was an emerging science in 1970-71 because whatever work was done at that time was only on the atmospheric combustion. Even the great uh, scientists of that era, Spalding was the father figure as far as the modeling of the combustion is concerned, droplet combustion is concerned. Forest fire, he was the man who, who had studied that. So having studied that, I thought whenever I get a time, I'll work on high pressure droplet combustion. This is the history of my grinding into the combustion area. And fortunately, I also got the opportunity that I joined DRDL and in DRDL I went to join liquid propulsion which is the area where you talk of liquid propulsion starting with different kinds of liquids propellants, and they burn only through the process of droplet formation, droplet vaporization and then mixing of the various propellants and then reaction kinetics producing heat, energy and expanding into a rocket chamber. So all through my life, 30, 30, 40 years, this has been the core plan. I got an opportunity to be part of the Combustion Institute because of my another guru, Professor Natarajan, who, with whom I registered for my PhD in IIT Madras. And uh, again, he said that we'll work on high pressure droplet combustion. For some reason, we did not complete those, uh, that PhD. But he is the one who introduced me to the Combustion Institute, and I became a member from that time. And sometime these people said that now is the time for you to take over the Combustion Institute. And I think from nine, Dr. Chari was the Combustion Institute chairman. He forced me into that, and uh, today you see me as president. For many years, I have been now part of this organization. But this organization, Combustion Institute, has done wonderful work over the years by introducing combustion science to a large number of students across the country. Various institutions, we, that is why, as Dr. Pandey was mentioning, we take our uh, conferences to various institutes, whether it's public or private. We go to national laboratories, we conduct seminars, we conduct training courses, biennial courses. The whole idea is to keep the flame of combustion burning across the country. That's the whole idea we are having. I personally believe today that uh, having come to Graphic Era University, I think we should also start a center of combustion research as far as your university is concerned. I will be very happy <laughs> that some of your students, some of your faculty members, from mechanical engineering, from the chemical engineering, or whichever department, whosoever is interested. By the way, even the computer science people are entering into the combustion today. That is the kind of thing that is happening. Because the whole concept of modeling is now changing. Because combustion modeling with the new era of uh, 
data analytics and AI is going to completely get transformed. So that is where all of you will become the part of the journey. This is a story of the Combustion Institute and I would like to certainly make this as part of your system. Second area which I have started working on and I would like to introduce to all of you and that is where we need to get uh, the efforts of all of us is the energy transition which is the re requirement of the day to day. Again energy has an ingredient because why we are talking of energy transition? Because we are talking of energy transition because all forms of energy production so far have been responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. Fossil fuels have been used right from 1800s onwards and uh, till about 1900 and so. The impact of the fossil fuels on the climate has not been so much. But after 1900, 1990 onwards, there has been a sharp rise as far as the emissions are concerned because of the extensive industrial activity which has been done the poor. The transportation systems have multiplied. Once upon a time in India, we used to have a few ambassador cars and the, uh, and the Fiat cars. But after 1980s, with the onset of Maruti, the expansion of the transportation in India has gone multifold. Thereby what you see is that today you will see the pollution which is being caused in India. The transportation comes at the number third. Number first is our power plants, which are coal-based power plants generally. We had almost about 1170 million tons of carbon dioxide being emitted per year by the by the, the, the thermal power plant. We have almost about 600 and odd coming from the industrial activities like steel plants, the cement plants, the coal plants, the aluminum plants and so on. And 372 million tons of CO2 is being emitted by all the vehicles which all of us are driving, whether they are commercial vehicles or personal vehicles. So we are responsible for because IC engines is one of the parts of the, we are responsible for a huge amount of pollution. And so, what is the impact of that pollution? That the temperature rise is taking place. We used to be less than one degree Celsius in 1900. Today we are already reaching 1.1 degree Celsius and we have set a limit based upon the various international discussions and collaborations and dialogue that have taken place of 1.5 degrees Celsius. That if you go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, the climate is going to be adversely impacted. Already the signs are visible, the glaciers are melting, the global warming is taking place, you are seeing the oceans rising, you are seeing the diversity getting affected. And uh, Dr. Kamal was talking about pollution index, you see Delhi and other places where we have huge pollution taking place. Because of that, I think our Honorable Prime Minister has made enormous amount of initiative, taken initiative and committed as a nation in COP26 and 27 that we will bring down our carbon dioxide emissions to net zero by 2070. And we are also going to do what is called reduce our intensity, carbon intensity, by about 45% by 2034. That's a very close year. We are also going to have 500 gigawatts of renewable energy in the system. We are going to have almost about 200 billion tons of CO2 that is going to be reduced. These are the commitments which our country has made. If these commitments have to be followed, the scientists, the engineers, and all of you who are working in this area have a tremendous job to be done. One of the jobs that has to be done is to change our energy production strategy. The energy production strategy which has been at the forefront is in terms of bringing more and more renewable energy, which is non-polluting. And that's why our push on sun, uh, solar energy, our push on wind energy, our energy from biomass, and so on. But that is all for production of electricity and heat. But what about mobility? When you are talking of mobility, it becomes very important that we switch over from 
the present fossil fuels to cleaner fuels. Even in the case of energy, we are talking of clean fuels like clean coal technologies or clean fuels like hydrogen and things like that. So the R&D activity which is needed today is now to look out for this transition, what we are talking of, using cleaner fuels in IC engines and also transiting to electric mobility, hybrid mobility and so on. In the recent G20 conference, I was giving a talk and we introduced the strategy for India for energy transition that said that majority of the energy will come from renewables. Majority of the present thermal power plants will become cleaner with carbon capture utilization of the carbon dioxide and the emissions which are coming. Then you will also have bioenergy in for production of energy. But most important for the mobility was electric mobility and the alternate fuels. So in the area of alternate fuels, three fuels were identified. Already government of India has introduced blending of gas uh, ethanol in the gasoline, which is, a, which is being raised from about 10% to 20% today which reduces the emissions by about 35%, but that's still not a very satisfactory situation. We have also developed, as somebody was reading in my introduction, that we have developed a strategy for going for methanol as a clean fuel. And methanol can be blended in gasoline. Methanol can be blended in diesel. That has been the exercise which has been done by our great friend sitting here, uh, Krishna Sadagopal. He has developed a... Fifteen percent blending of uh, methanol in diesel, and uh, I just want to inform you that in Bombay Municipal Transport Corporation, we are having about uh, ten buses running today on MD 15 under the trial. Almost about fifty thousand kilometers are going to be completed in that. That's the beginning of this particular blending, which will reduce again emissions by about thirty-five percent, and also cost to the consumer will be to the extent of per liter about 7 to 8 rupees. So that is the kind of impact it is going to be there on your pocket. So this, this kind of exercise are being done. In addition to that, he is already developing a commercial truck or a commercial vehicle which can run on 100% methanol. If you see 100% methanol, that means again your emissions, there won't be any NOx, there won't be any SOx, there won't be any particulate matter. There will be pure carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor. So this is the kind of advantage you have. But friends, in spite of all these clean fuels and all that, to meet the requirement of the vagaries of the solar energy, and uh, vagaries and the renewable energy, which is actually we have also introduced as part of the energy transition strategy what we call as the nuclear energy as a, to take care of the base load. And in the base load, we are talking of introduction of what is called small modular nuclear reactors. The advantage of small modular nuclear reactors is that they are factory built, flexible in operation, they can be integrated with any industrial unit, they can replace the aging thermal power plants, they are going to be cheaper on a long-term basis and they can be, they won't require so much of safety uh, constraint what we have today with the large size plants. So the world over, there is a tremendous amount of work being done. So for this community which is here today of the students and the researcher, I would say in addition to that combustion research center which I mentioned, you should also start looking at SMR as a technology because there are a large number of uh, associated technologies which can be integrated with that. For example, the new turbine cycle, the heat exchangers, and variety of things that can happen. For the IC engine people, I have the major challenge which is emerging is because everybody is talking of cleanest fuel of future is the hydrogen. Hydrogen, when it is burnt, it only produces water vapor. So, can't be anything cleaner than that. 
But the hydrogen today has three problems. Problem is production of hydrogen. How do you produce hydrogen? Presently in the industrial sector, hydrogen is being produced from natural gas in majority of the country. Even in our own country, wherever it is being done, it is by natural gas like Indian oil uh, refineries and alkali uh, um, processes and so on. But then when you do it from natural gas along with hydrogen, you also produce carbon dioxide. So it's polluting. That's, not, that's why it's called grey hydrogen. Another method is to use solar energy, wind energy and do electrolysis of water and produce hydrogen. That's called, as on today, it's called green energy, yeah, green hydrogen. And then, of course, you can use biomass for producing hydrogen. But the problem today is the cost of electrolyzers is so high, the cost of power which is used for electrolyzing is so high that the cost of hydrogen is not affordable, the green hydrogen. So the answer lies in producing green hydrogen from, say, natural gas or coal. But whatever carbon dioxide is coming out, if you can capture it, through a carbon capture utilization and storage process, then you will be able to convert it into a blue hydrogen. And that blue hydrogen is cheaper. If you take the cost of green hydrogen today, it is in the region of four to five dollars per kg. Whereas the cost of blue hydrogen is in the region of one to two dollars per kg. So any industry which is using hydrogen today, if it uses blue hydrogen, it is affordable. If it is going to use green hydrogen, it is not affordable. That's why the demand is not there. My personal take on this is our demand will increase if we switch over to hydrogen as a fuel for mobility. So first thing what you should do is, as IC engines, is to start working on developing IC engines working on a direct injection of hydrogen at the earliest instead of injecting methanol, ethanol, diesel, or petrol, I think we should devise quickly the engine methods which will use hydrogen. So that is a research challenge, and my friends are already working. I think Dr. Ravi Krishna is working on a opposed piston kind of a IC engine for hydrogen. Many other scientists are also working. The time has come for us to accelerate this program and introduce hydrogen IC engines at the earliest. Another source of utilization of hydrogen is through the fuel cell. If you can use hydrogen, pass it through a fuel cell, generate electricity, and drive a motor, then the present problem what all of us are facing today of non-availability of electric mobility or the batteries for commercial vehicles, for the trucks. You know why? Because if I need to drive a truck, the weight of the lithium ion battery is going to be the order of two to three tons. So that is not affordable because the payload capacity will come down. So we have to switch over to use of green hydrogen or blue hydrogen for driving the commercial trucks. So that is another research area. I would request the IC engine team to start working on that as early as possible. The best method is take methanol or ammonia do a reforming of that. When I say reforming, convert methanol into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Absorb carbon dioxide into some absorbent. Take hydrogen into the fuel cell and drive the motor. I think that will be the fastest and the best method of doing the, uh, solving the problem of commercial trucks. So friends, there are lots of challenges today. And the last challenge I would like, in fact, over the breakfast table I was discussing with some of my colleagues. We have been working on electric, uh, on the catalytic converters for a large number of IC engines. Even every vehicle today, which is being equipped with the BS6 uh, uh, parameters, is using some elect, uh, catalytic converters to reduce the particulate matter, to reduce NOx, to reduce SOx. But nobody has given enough attention that we, are, we can also do something with the carbon dioxide, with the carbon monoxide. Maybe with why we have not been able to find a solution for absorbing or disintegrating or dissociating CO2, CO in some form so that 
even the fossil fuels will not emit these emissions. I am throwing up this as a challenge for all of you, those who are working in this area. Maybe some of you should start looking at that in a big way. To conclude my talk today, I would say that the challenges to the combustion community are very, very high. Many people have started thinking that with the onset of e-mobility, combustion will not be required. But combustion is an industrial process. Whether it's a blast furnace in the, in the, in the steel making or, or any other industrial activity, like cement plant or kilns or anything, to generate heat, you will still need combustion because generate heat from electricity is not going to be a very uh, affordable solution. So it becomes very important to continuously do research on combustion, continuously start working on uh, uh, reducing the kind of emissions which com combustion produces, solving the problem of capturing carbon dioxide, and then absorbing it and carbon dioxide, when absorbed, is not waste, by the way. You can, from carbon dioxide, you can make methanol. From carbon dioxide, you can make car polycarbonate. From carbon dioxide, you can make graphene. You can make hundreds of useful items from this through a chemical process. So it is important that we start working on that. And whatever CO2 is remaining, we can do sequestration into the ocean bed in the various methods. We can use carbon dioxide for enhancing the oil recovery. We can use carbon dioxide for carbon uh, coal-based methane uh, production. So there are enormous number of usage. Only thing is our imagination of technology and building it at an affordable cost is important. So research is required, work is required, and all my young friends who are present here, in addition to your computer science, which you are doing very well, I saw the number of students who have gone into the service sector uh, doing wonderful job, earning good packages. But I think there is a lot of package which is available even in the energy sector, in the mobility sector. If you do that, that deep science is going to also give you a lot of packages. People are already switching over in the disruptive technology area where amount of money will be available to all of you much more than what your service sector like the FinTech or the IT enabled services are giving. So please go ahead, please soil your hands in these kinds of research areas. Future is bright. I wish you all the best and hope that you will become part of the combustion community and members of the combustion of, his, combustion of India. And this university will be one of the core centers for that. Thank you very much. God bless you. gentlemen, a big round of applause for Dr. V.K. Sarasat, please. Uh, I think it's the right moment. Uh, let me uh, ask the team here to assist me uh, in asking Honorable Chairman, sir, to please present a mentor, a token of our gratitude to Dr. To Dr. V.K. Saraswat for his fantastic, insightful speech and his presence here. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Professor V.K. Saraswat. done with the So on behalf of uh, Combustion Institute Indian section, I would request Dr. Saswat to give away the memento to 
Professor Kamal Gansal, Gansala for his vision and uh, the leadership what he has shown in not, not only that setting up this infrastructure and the such a beautiful campus, but also inviting all of us to be here. So thank you so much. What we're doing now is we're rearranging the stage a bit. Uh, I'll request the guests to be seated on the front row now, the ones that we had on the stage. And this is while we prepare for our first lecture today. Photographers carry light me at. <laughs> Perfectly visible. So there's a bit of a reshuffle. We have uh, altered the stage a bit and you can see that it's perfectly set up for a nice warm and at times intense lecture. Uh, we have uh, another very eminent guest for you who will be talking to you over the next 45 minutes, one hour for um, on a topic that is very close to the heart of uh, most young Indian boys, <laughs> at times girls as well. Uh, I will not take much time. Uh, I will call on stage uh, the former distinguished scientist and director general, uh, DRDO, and ex CEO and MD, Brahmos Aerospace. Anything that you need to know about ballistic missiles of any kind, he is your man. Be ready with your questions. I would love to call on stage, please, Dr. Sudhir Mishra, with a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.
Good morning, Dr. V.K. Saraswat, member Niti Aayog, and uh, having so many caps, distinguished caps, and uh, Dr. Kamal, and other dignitaries, faculty, academicians, students, and friends. I am very proud and privileged to deliver Dr. V. K. Saraswat endowment address. My association with uh, Dr. V. K. Saraswat goes back to 39 years. There is a story, very short story I would like to narrate that the day I joined the RDL, I was sitting in the ante room, not ante room exactly, it was his PS room and uh, there was a young man with his specs full of energy, getting into the Dr. Kalam room, coming out very frequently. And uh, I asked, uh, at that time, uh, Mrs. Dikshit was uh, PS to Dr. Kalam. And I asked her, who is this gentleman, full of energy, vigor, and uh, uh, guts to get into the director office very frequently. She told, he, uh, you know, who is Vijay? I said, no, no, I don't know Vijay. So she said that, uh, uh, do you know Amitabh Bachchan? I said, yes, I know Amitabh Bachchan. Do you know his usual name in the movies? I said, yes, Vijay. She said, he's the same guy, <laughs> with the same energy, with the same kind of uh, hero -ship. So uh, this is the thing he himself may not be knowing. But this is the way others used to appreciate and uh, recognize him. The second is, I have witnessed his uh, leadership, technology management, project management, and the way he used to guide scientists in the, their endeavors, uh, appreciable. Uh, I want to tell here that if this country gets maybe 25 people like Dr. Saraswat, this country would become superpower in 10 years. This is possible. And uh, the third thing is, uh, because we have grown up watching him, we ourselves have inculcated, imbibed many of the qualities. And one quality I really appreciate in him is, he never forgave mediocrity. He believes that you have to deliver your best. And uh, we, uh, I will not call our team as a youngsters, but as a youngsters, we followed and uh, whatever we could achieve, he has a great, great uh, role to play in our lives. Of course, indirectly, but we all learn from our uh, leaders. So this is, with this background, I would like to carry on. And uh, now, uh, you will give me the, so that I can control my own presentation or somebody else would do that. They can do it, but okay, fine. Uh, next, please. Uh, I would like to tell you that India has been the birthplace of rocket science. Uh, Chinese have uh, discovered the explosives as a propulsion long back as a rocket, but uh, India has uh, managed, India has devised to use uh, rockets as a weapon. And uh, Tipu Sultan has used it in the war uh, in 1792 in uh, Srirangapatnam. And uh, subsequently, he lost the war, but it was uh, uh, re-engineered by, next. Next, please. Uh, no, if you give me the, I would myself control it, then it would be much better. Uh, so, so, sir, uh, William Congreve, uh, who uh, was a British engineer, uh, he re-engineered it to three kilometers. It was a very simple rocket. At one end, we had uh, uh, propulsion, explosive, and the other end, a, a rocket kind of thing which can take it into the air. And uh, Britishers have used it in various wars. 
and uh, in the US uh, Civil War also, uh, there is a indirect mention of uh, Tipu's rocket in the fifth line of their uh, national anthem. When they say that the rocket's red glare, the bomb busting in the air, this is nothing but the Tipu's rocket. And uh, I would like to tell youngsters uh, how the rocketry has been mastered by the Russians and uh, Americans. Uh, in the Second World War, Germany was the leader in the rocket technology. And uh, when they lost it, the scientists, the German scientists were divided into two groups. One group went to US, the second group went to Russia. And uh, the story of uh, American scientists in the development of rocketry is given here. So uh, more than uh, 1,500 German scientists, they migrated to US under the Operation Paperclip. And uh, around 2000 went to Russia. Uh, these scientists, they re-engineered, reassembled the V2 rockets. And uh, the first long-range Redstone ballistic missile was uh, the further development of uh, V2 rockets. Uh, subsequently, uh, there was a scientist called Van Braun who led the, uh, the moon mission. He was also a German scientist. He developed Saturn V and uh, then US reached to the moon on 16 July. And uh, Russians, they went into the liquid propulsion rocket mode because they could, they could get hold of the scientists who were specialists in the liquid propulsion. And uh, they came out with a Sputnik and uh, they made the first person to uh, orbit the satellite into the space. And uh, so on, they developed their technologies. Uh, in 1991, when the US invaded Iraq, uh, we watched very closely the role of cruise missiles because the cruise missiles, thousands of them, they were uh, fired in the Persian Gulf and uh, Iraq had very strong uh, land forces and uh, air defense. But within 24 hours, the land forces were destroyed, the command and control centers were finished and uh, the US land forces, they simply walked in and uh, the whole Iraq surrendered within uh, 24 hours. So this was the power of the cruise missiles. And uh, we in India watched it. And uh, sometime in the 90s when Dr. Kalam visited Russia, and uh, I think you may all remember that uh, Russia economy busted. Soviet economy got dismembered, Russian economy busted, and they were willing to share uh, the joint venture with us. So we identified our strength. Russians uh, told their own strength. And we came out with an idea that we can together make a cruise missile. Uh, there is a difference of uh, cruise and ballistic missiles. Uh, the cruise missiles are like uh, pilot-free aircraft. And uh, the strategic missile, the ballistic missiles are like the way you throw a stone in the air and it comes. So the trajectory is ballistic. So that's why it's called ballistic. But in the cruise missiles, you have the control from launch till the final point. So this is the beauty of cruise missiles. And BrahMos is a cruise missile. So if you see here, the flow was Dr. Kalam, he witnessed half-developed engine, uh, which was followed by the visit of Russians to India. And uh, then there were round of discussion. In one of the discussion in maybe 95, 96, you can see me here. I was very young at that time, a boyish look. So uh, and then in 98, we came out with an intergovernment agreement. And that's how the BrahMos took birth. And uh, it was a joint venture. Uh, I'll call it the first FDI in the defense sector, first uh, foreign direct investment by any foreign country in India. And uh, uh, the capital was 250 million US dollars, which was subsequently increased to 300 million dollars so that we can develop the air version also. And uh, we decided the work share. The work share was the guidance system platforms, testing evaluation, control uh, command center will be developed by India. And uh, ramjet seeker booster, they will be by Russia. Today, uh, we have indigenously already developed the, the seeker and booster in our country. Uh, it was not a TOT project. 
POT means transfer of technology project. It was the make by specifications that we shared the specification with each other and based on the specifications, we have chosen the materials, we have chosen the design and uh, came out with a product which will meet the requirement, which will meet the final specifications expected from that subsystems. So this is the way we did. So it was never a TOT. Uh, it was a joint venture in the real spirit and sense. There are various kinds of uh, the Brahmos. Uh, we decided to not give different names to uh, the Brahmos versions. Uh, we have uh, the land launch versions, and there is always a difference in all the versions. There's a land launch version, there is a ship launched, there is a air launched, and uh, these uh, can have different kind of trajectories, right from 10 meters to 14 kilometers altitude. Uh, the missile specifications broadly are uh, like this. The weight is about uh, 3,000 kilograms, but for the air version, it is uh, 2,200 kilograms. Uh, and uh, it can operate in the diverse environment, uh, snow, mountains, desert, plains, tropical sea, and uh, it can engage various kinds of target. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you that most of the material taken from the open sources, internet, so there is hardly anything which is secret in this. Now, if you see the naval version, the very first version was ship to ship version. Uh, in this, uh, we uh, developed the inclined launch and the vertical launch. And uh, then we conducted uh, the launch from a submarine also. Submarine in a sense, we it was mimicking the submarine from the undersea. So you can see the destructive power of the, the Brahmos in this. Uh, from one ship we launched to another uh, sh uh, ship, our own discarded ship. It was weighing around uh, 4,000 tons and uh, in about uh, 10 minutes the ship was, uh, it was broken into two pieces and got sunk in 10 minutes. Uh, the second flight you can see here uh, it's about land-to-land uh, -land version. In this, uh, uh, this flight we conducted in around, I think, uh, 2015. 15. And uh, the beauty was uh, that uh, immediately after conducting the flight test, we handed over to the users. And uh, in, in hundreds of the numbers, the missile was produced. And uh, uh, in this, it was a vertical launch and vertical attack. So in this flight, you would be able to see the precisionness of the missile. So the first flight was without warhead. The second day, and you can see that it has traveled almost uh, 210 kilometers and uh, gone and hit at the center of the target. The other day, we did it with the warhead. So with the warhead, we hit almost the same point at a distance of about two or three meters. So this demonstrated the precisionness, precision uh, attack capability of the missile. And uh, so this is the background of the Brahmos. Now I'll come to the, the air launched version. Air launched version is uh, different than other missiles, uh, but it was necessary for you to, for the sake of uh, completeness, it was necessary for you to understand about the management, about the financial arrangement, administrative, and uh, uh, the other versions of missiles. So in this uh, air version, air launch version, of course, there are many engineering details are there, but uh, I would, uh, uh, because it's a very heterogeneous uh, gathering, so I would like to uh, jump. But in case if you have any specific question, you can always ask at the end of uh, the presentation. So. <coughs> the basic specification of the missile were that uh, we were supposed to integrate the BrahMos air version with much uh, less weight to the underbelly of uh, Sukhoi 30. And uh, the, there were specifications of uh, Sukhoi 30 given that uh, the aircraft would be flying at the speed of almost 0 0.8, 0 0.9 Mach. And you have to launch the missile from that speed and it should go and uh, hit the target in the sea and in the land. Uh, 
So the difference is when you are hitting at a uh, ship, ship is a moving object, so you have to have a seeker in the missile. Uh, but if it is a land attack, then seeker is not required. You have other means of uh, INS op and uh, GPS combined. You have uh, that arrangement to hit the target. So in this, uh, uh, we reduce the weight of uh, the missile to 2.2 uh, ton. And uh, initially, we uh, tested the missile to, to 90 kilometers. Uh, later on, we have increased it to much higher. And uh, here in the picture, you can see uh, the launcher, the launcher integrated with missile to the Sukhoi 30 underbelly. And uh, the challenges which we faced uh, in the implementation of uh, Brahmos air version, I would discuss further. Before that, I would like to see, I would like to show you uh, some of the unpleasant incidents, they never happened with the Brahmos, but they happened with other tests. So if you see, you would understand what we have done and what were the challenges. And uh, if we go wrong, then what could have happened with us, with Sukhoi 30? Uh, the cost of Sukhoi 30 is almost uh, 400 crore. Uh, a simple silly mistake can destroy the aircraft as well as can put the life of a pilot at peril. So these were the challenges. And uh, these are some of the flights uh, which got damaged due to air launched uh, missiles. So some of the incidents are shown here. So immediately after the separation, the missile is not going down and uh, hitting the aircraft. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a sound in every video. It's not coming. So th these uh, pictures are of some older missiles, but there are some movies of newer missiles and aircraft also. This is a much newer incident. So after launch, the missile has gone into completely different direction. I think you are operating it. I'm not. So it's OK. Yathat, uh, it's OK. No problem. It's OK. Just leave it. Come to the presentation so that uh, I can continue. You can, uh, Yathar, you can leave it. You just close the video and uh, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. So <coughs> the task called for uh, Sukhoi 30 modification because in the Sukhoi 30, in the belly, there is there are two hard points, but the hard points were quite distant. And uh, our uh, missile was slightly shorter. So, uh, and it has never carried the Sukhoi 30 never had the capability to carry uh, around 2.9 ton uh, in the belly. So 
that was the one challenge. The second was uh, there was no readily available launcher uh, available in which we can integrate the Brahmos and uh, launch. So the third was we had to carry out the electrical and mechanical integration of uh, the missile launcher to the aircraft. And fourth was to reduce the weight of the missile. Uh, in the, when you fly, then each kg matters. And uh, we uh, started first, and you see the first thing, and the most important thing is uh, this country, we never had experience of uh, developing a air launch missile, integrating with the aircraft and uh, flying, conducting test. We never had even the experience of uh, uh, missile separation from the aircraft, a dumb missile separation from the aircraft, our own missile. Of course, we have been firing the foreign make missiles, but our own missiles, we never had any experience. So we started working with these constraints, limitations, and uh, lack of uh, scientific knowledge. So uh, here, uh, I would like to tell you one more very important thing, uh, that uh, when you uh, develop anything for air, you need uh, uh, to test it against uh, set data. Now those set datas are not available in the country because the inspection Q agencies don't have access to, to the data. They have never conducted those experiments, so there's no data available. The foreign OEM or foreign supplier will not give you that data. He will charge you hundreds of the millions of dollars only for that information, uh, which can, which allow you, which facilitate you to conduct that particular uh, experiment. So the challenge was, that in our own country, we have to create the data, we have to test the data, and uh, we have to test the data against our developed system and come out with a successful design. So we were working in a very close, uh, tight situation. And uh, whatever inspection agencies were available in the country, uh, DGQA, DGAQA, NAI, uh, then uh, Semilac, and uh, many uh, IITs, NITs, we gathered all the people and uh, told that we need to develop this. So please share us the information. And uh, as I progress, you would see the contribution of each and every institution of this country. So uh, when we started uh, uh, thinking of integrating the missile with the aircraft, uh, the OEM of uh, Sukhoi 30, they said uh, we would help you in integrating, but we would charge you around 300 USD dollars. Uh, 300 USD was huge money. Even now it's a huge money. We said, no, we don't have, uh, we were given 200 crore by Indian Air Force to carry out the integration of missile with the Sukhoi 30. Now, we found out that HL, the only agency which can do this work, we spoke to CMD, HL and uh, told him the challenge and uh, uh, he accepted it very unwillingly uh, but it was a national challenge so he said yes we would help you in doing that and uh, we completed uh, uh, this aircraft uh, let me tell you something more about the modification so what did we do uh, we uh, literally ripped apart the Sukhoi 30 from the belly upwards. Uh, we strengthened the first hard point and the second hard point was far away. So we created another hard point. We again given it a number two. So uh, when you uh, rip apart uh, the, the skin of an aircraft, you reach to the structure. And uh, if you do any uh, re-engineering uh, with the structure, it is uh, like, you know, uh, uh, creating another aircraft. So, a lot of agencies got involved. Uh, we literally uh, split the aircraft into two, carried out the engineering uh, work, uh, welding, uh, then creating new ma uh, structural members, and uh, which can provide higher strength, and uh, reassemble the aircraft. And uh, once it is, uh, aircraft is assembled, uh, the aircraft had to undergo several tests uh, spread over about nine months. And uh, the test pilots of HAL got involved. 
then SDI, Software Development Institute of Indian Air Force, and uh, AST of Indian Air Force, they got involved and carried out this work. And uh, in the picture, you can see the then HL chairman in the air show, he handed over uh, this uh, re-engineered aircraft to us. Uh, and uh, this work was certified by Semilac, uh, which is the agency to certify uh, aircraft for HL. Uh, we did another work, that is this uh, wind tunnel test. So what happens when the aircraft, because it's a aircraft with, with a launcher, with a missile, so you have to conduct uh, three kind of uh, wind tunnel test. Uh, the wind tunnel test with the missile, then you have to conduct the drop test of the, the missile in the wind tunnel. And uh, then there is a company called uh, uh, views uh, numericals. Uh, it was start up in the IIT Mumbai complex, and uh, they did uh, CFT work. And uh, what we realized that the CFT analysis, the wind tunnel test, and the flight data, they almost matched. And uh, the people, they, uh, the in Indian and Russian scientists, both were surprised that how come these tests are matching. Either we were lucky or we were doing some mistake somewhere. So uh, I believe in the second one because some data might be still missing uh, because things cannot be so much conforming, 100% correct. So uh, the various kinds of uh, CFD analysis were conducted, some pictures of uh, uh, the volume mesh for subsonic and supersonic are shown here. Uh, then wind tunnel test, it was conducted at two places, uh, one at uh, NAL, uh, the second was uh, at uh, SAGI. So at uh, wind tunnel test, NAL we conducted up to 1.3 Mach and uh, beyond that we conducted at SAGI, Moscow. And uh, the test gave us huge confidence that uh, if we fly aircraft with missile, it will work. So the launcher design was again very complicated and uh, there was no launcher available in the country which we can re-engineer to suit our requirement or there was no launcher available which we can buy from the Russians or buy from any other source in the country. So we had to develop it uh, from the scratch and uh, in this launcher the Indian Air Force was very particular. Particular in the sense they were saying that the, the missile has to separate in the cleanest possible manner, number one. Number two, the launcher has to merge with the aerodynamic of the Sukhoi 30. Uh, many of you are from the aeronautics background. Uh, if you do the serial production of the aircraft, each aircraft, they vary by 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter, sometimes 200 millimeters. So uh, making the launcher conforming to the skin of the underbelly of uh, aircraft, that was a big challenge. Uh, the third was uh, the materials, the long uh, materials, rod, extruded, they were not available. There was only one place, Ordnance Factory, Ambajari. Uh, they had this facility, extrusion. Uh, but when we were extruding it, a uh, lot of problems were there. Uh, there were inclusion in the materials, number one. Number two, when we do the extrusion, the bending uh, was coming out and we were not able to straighten it. And uh, with uh, 100 of the days spent together with Ordnance Factory and uh, there is an aluminum association, again based at Nagpur, so we involved them. Uh, we brought uh, anybody who said, I know something about aluminum. We said, please come, work with us. Tell us how to do it. So. That took huge amount of time. And uh, initially for separation, we made uh, solenoid valve and uh, solenoid valve based uh, separators and uh, Indian Air Force said, we want one more. The one which we selected, Air Force rejected. They said, no, no, we want one more kind. So we came out with another one gas generator based. And uh, uh, it was uh, a huge task because the temperature was varying from plus 71 degree to minus 40 degree. And uh, more than the design work, it was the testing. Uh, in the ground, the test facilities were not available. And uh, we had to create the facilities. Our vendors, uh, they, they are used to make only the, the things which gives them a commercial return. Uh, but 
uh, when we told them that this is a national challenge and if we are able to be successful, you will get business, but apart from the business, you will get the knowledge and you will get into the, the supply chain of high-tech items, not only for India, but for abroad also. So this kind of uh, you know, uh, motivational talk, it has resulted into some success and uh, we came out with a launcher which was again uh, tested it was tested uh, for uh, vibration uh, at the ideal hyderabad uh, it was developed uh, it was tested for shock test at uh, r&d engineers pune and uh, we tested the pneumatic actuation system uh, in one of the uh, facility of uh, a private company in hyderabad and uh, we uh, successfully, we could develop successfully this uh, solenoid valve. Uh, these were not the standard items available. The similar specification items were available, but they were not able to operate in this stringent conditions. And uh, after the successful integration uh, of the mechanical one, we also integrated uh, the PCD. PCD is a peripheral control device. It's a kind of fire control system. Uh, it's a software and hardware and electronics, both all three combined. Uh, usually in the aircrafts, uh, this PCD is uh, integrated with the aircraft because OEM, they already know what kind of uh, 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 the package, the size communication bus would be required for this. Uh, but it was not available. So we had to uh, integrate this uh, peripheral control device in the launcher itself, uh, given the space limitations, very stringent uh, uh, environment specification, it was, the, the work became almost double or triple. And uh, then we had to create a, a communication bus also between the launcher and the aircraft. Uh, so it was a mechanical integration, electrical integration, and a software integration also because uh, we had to give access to the pilot uh, how to launch the missile, when to launch, how to feed in the data. So it was a very complicated thing. And uh, uh, we have uh, also conducted modification in the ramjet for high altitude ignition. Some additional set of control services were added and uh, then uh, the aerostructural modifications were carried out. And uh, so in the hardware and software side, few of the changes which we carried out, they are listed here. And uh, for us, it was a big challenge because Sukhoi 30 never carried 2.5 ton of any kind of uh, you know, payload in their uh, belly or in the other hard points. So we had to ensure that these things are in the implemented in our work. And uh, on 25th June, we conducted the first captive flight test. The missile launcher was integrated with the aircraft and it has carried out about 40 minutes of uh, flight uh, at Nasik. And uh, in uh, on 31st August, we carried out 16. We carried out the separation test. So you please see the separation of the BrahMos missile with the other separation, which I have shown you in the leading to the unpleasant. You see, it is looking inclined because the other pilot was taking from picture from an angle. Otherwise, it was a clean horizontal drop. Uh, now, what are the consequences of uh, this uh, the BrahMos? to this part of the world. Uh, you see, the range of the Sukhoi 30 is about uh, 3,400 kilometers, means uh, it take off, takes off, goes to 1,600, 1,700 kilometers and return back. Now, so you, and then you have another 300 kilometers with this. So this is the first range. The second is, if you do the mid-air refueling uh, once, then the range increases by another uh, uh, 3,000. Now you do the, mid-air refueling while coming and going both times. So then you can see the range. So we cover almost, uh, you know, whole of China. We goes up to the Australia. We cover large part of uh, Africa, then little bit of uh, Europe. So this is the uh, power. This is the kind of uh, 
uh, strength uh, we have uh, given to Indian Air Force. And uh, uh, you please see the flight test. Uh, it's a air to sea launch. So aircraft has uh, dropped the missile. And uh, initially, the booster ignites. Uh, and uh, it the nose cone is uh, ejected. Then the booster has ignited. And uh, the speed is very high, so aircraft can't chase it. And uh, it has gone and hit the, the target. So the another helicopter has gone and uh, taken the picture and sent it to us. Uh, so this was about air to sea. Uh, this is uh, air to land. So we have uh, conducted the precision hit against the land target in the Andamans uh, Islands. So we are supposed to go and hit at the center of uh, this uh, 30 meter square. So the missile has gone and hit it. So this is the, the summary of our uh, achievements. And uh, the most important thing is uh, Indian Air Force has created uh, a unit at uh, Thanjavur. Uh, although they had this uh, uh, airstrip and uh, a very small detachment uh, deployed there, uh, but they created a, a functional unit at uh, Thanjavur. And uh, they have uh, already deployed uh, a squadron comprising of dozens of aircraft with Sukhoi 30. And uh, the objective is to uh, provide security in the Indo-Pacific region. In fact, we were talking only about Indian Ocean region. But uh, US came out and said, no, no, you are supposed to provide security uh, to Indo-Pacific region. So uh, we are providing security in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, although it's a very small, but at that time, I'll read it for you. Air Chief Marshal Bhadoria has said that the decision to deploy the Sukhoi 30 MKI at Thanjavur was taken due to the strategic location. Uh, the Sukhoi 30 MKI inducted is equipped with a special weapon. The special weapon is a Brahmos, and it will provide security in the Indian Ocean, in the Bay of Bengal, in the Arabian Sea, and uh, you have seen the uh, what inspired us. Actually, it's for the youngsters. Uh, the first, second row is already inspired. Uh, they are doing great contribution to the nation. But for the youngsters, uh, Maharshi Patanjali has told that if you have a dream which is too big, uh, you don't worry. Uh, your uh, dormant forces, your energy, your connectivity will come automatically. And uh, you would be able to achieve uh, which is looking impossible as of now. So. But in the Sukhoi Brahmos NG, we can five Brahmos NG we can integrate. So that provides a lot of destructive capability to uh, fighter aircraft. It's a frontline aircraft, so it provides a lot of capability to it. How much money is available to invest? Pardon? How much money is available to invest? Other than taking the house? Uh, uh, when I left, uh, I achieved turnover of uh, 3,400 crore. And uh, the profit was about 400 crore. Yeah. When I joined, the turnover was 700 crore. So from 700 crore, taken up to that. The, huh, the problem was, we could have achieved much more, sir. Uh, but the problem was, Indian, uh, Indian armed forces said that uh, our deliveries should be like this, like uh, 50, 100, 200 every year. Uh, because they are worried about the lifetime cycle. Because after 10 years, they will have to again go back for the life extension of 200 missiles. So if they take at a go. So uh, the capability is there to manufacture. So we can, uh, we have uh, uh, four units for manufacturing. So number is not a problem. The user requirement is a, I will not say problem, it's their own perception. <coughs> Designing a 
Actually, the father of air defense system, uh, not only in India, but in the world, is sitting here right in front of you, Dr. V. K. Saraswat. So I would request him to answer it because, <coughs> sir. Thank you, sir. So, sir. Yes, I think uh, in India, so much is the rejection. The latest uh, missile that they have announced the second one. In comparison with other countries, as the features and the discussion capability of Burma is concerned, where will it stand? Uh, there are only two countries which have. Uh, the supersonic uh, cruise missile of this kind, uh, India and Russia. Uh, rest of the countries are also having the cruise missiles, but their speed is lesser than this. Uh, their range is also lesser than this. And uh, they are not uh, this much uh, destructive as this, uh, as a BrahMos missile is. A hypersonic uh, is a different domain. If when it comes to hypersonic, it's a different domain. Uh, again, in uh, there are many countries who are doing research in the hypersonics. Uh, you see, there is a, uh, there's not enough time, but I would like to tell you that uh, uh, Soviet Union and US uh, both started uh, research in the supersonic uh, combustion. And uh, uh, US, uh, usually they have a different kind of uh, business approach. So they subcontract it to the companies, uh, but after, uh, about seven, eight years and uh, a few billions of dollars of expenditure, they realize that it will take too much of amount of time and resources. So they dropped the idea. 
But uh, Soviet Union, being a communist country, they continued research in this. And uh, they uh, achieved uh, mastery over this technology. And they continued research in the hypersonics also. <coughs> so today they have a functional uh, hypersonic missile. The US, about four years back, uh, they started again work on the hypersonics. So they also, they have the knowledge, technology backbone. So, but uh, it will take at least 10, 15 years for them. You know, scramjet technology is very complicated. And even if you master the technology in the lab, uh, industrial skill is a different ball game. Then you need uh, hardened uh, electronics, uh, the materials, material processing, aerostructure. I mean, all those things will come into the play. Uh, again, very difficult thing. So, uh, in fact, Japan is also doing a lot of work in the hypersonics. Japan plus uh, China, China, they want to have done, they have taken the Russian missile and uh, did some changes in the structure and uh, declared it is uh, their own indigenous effort, but it's not. So, so this is the, the complete uh, system existing as far as the hypersonic is concerned. Actually, uh, when you talk about reusable missile, uh, what you are talking is uh, that you launch a missile uh, like a uh, aircraft and it goes and uh, drops. So the missile itself will be a vehicle. It will drop a missile, it drop a warhead and return back. So uh, the it's uh, when it comes to the idea, idea is very good. But uh, when it is in the actual war, uh, it's not possible. It's not possible, not feasible and uh, would be very expensive. Because uh, you're, uh, you see what happens, you, by deploying the missile, you are reducing the risk of a pilot. So uh, if you again uh, go back to, uh, the again, a, a mother ship launching a missile, so the mother ship has to be secured, it has to be protected. So when the mother ship after launching is returning back, it can again be taken on by the, uh, by the air defense system. So uh, if it comes to the idea, it's very good. But uh, practical implementation, a bit complicated, complex, and uh, not economical as of now. But, but some time back. Time Sir, am I right? Yeah. You like to add anything more? I Thank you, sir. It, in fact, Dr. Kalam was a great propagator of this idea, that reusable missile. So, uh, please. But, but hypersonic?
responsible in assembly. Then the radar is the space-based, land-based, ship-based. All these little uh, mode. Now we are Radars are available. They are available. The space-based systems are there. Oh, okay. Land-based are there. Ship-based are there. They can observe it and tell you, give you the warning. It, it can give you the warning. Yeah, they can give you warning. But you see, what happens? So it depends on the kind of air defense system, the, the radars you have. Uh, who are your enemies? Like, some time back uh, inside Pakistan, accidentally the Brahmos was launched. It went inside without any challenge, without any, without knowing them. So, so if your enemy is Pakistan, anything is possible. Just no, because in. hypersonic and supersonic are very predictive pathways. With China, it will be difficult. Yeah, with China is difficult. With other developed countries, it will be difficult. But with other, it's easy thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I request you to be on stage, please. I will, in the meanwhile, I am requesting Honorable Chairman, sir, to come over and uh, express our gratitude with the token of our appreciation. Jokes apart, sir, you look uh, handsome in all of the photographs. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Dr. Steve Fisher. Stage uh, Senior Vice President Ashok Leyland, home to a lot of our alumni, uh, Dr. Krishnan Sargovan. In fact, he touched everything. Uh, for example, in which stage we are, for, uh, economics is getting destabilized because we are importing the crude. We are importing the crude for around 90%. So, 
So our energy requirement is increasing. Today we are refining around 250 million metric ton. We require 400 million metric ton. So energy requirements are increasing. And he rightly pointed out CO2, that is the temperature is increasing, 1 to 1.5 degree we put a C. There are certain theories with my experience I can tell you. That once I visited Aachen for um, Wissinger Institute, I was a guest, so I, I was taken in a big car, that is uh, maybe Audi at that time, it was one crew maybe. And uh, the driver asked, uh, I hope you are coming from India, I said yes. After some time the car became very warm and I am uncomfortable, I asked him what you are doing. He said you are from India, I put seat heater. The outside temperature is minus one. So then I asked him, what is your maximum temperature in this city? He said 23 degrees. That day I realized if 2 degree increased, they have to purchase fan and AC. Of course, the glacier story is there, the other story is also there. So definitely it's not allowed and I am from a city where Paris corner is there. Paris impact is not known to it because in winter it will go to 20 degree and in summer it is going to 55 degree. I saw the Brimos missile, minus 40 degree to 71 degree. So future automobile engineers will learn the temperature compatibility with from this maybe. So such a help is there. But however, uh, we from combustion scientists, we used to say how much energy, he was talking about energy transition. I am telling about energy conservation because uh, we are importing and we have to produce our own fuel and our mobility is inevitable now from two-wheeler to big tracks. Uh, so, Energy conservation is very important. In a simple sentence, we scientists used to call as a thermal efficiency. In a simple language for a wider audience, I can say if you use one liter petrol in your bike, hardly 250 ml or 280 ml is being used. And remaining is not waste, it's a big opportunity for all of us to innovate. Am I right, sir? Till 100% is a big opportunity, and combustion scientists are every year struggling to achieve that. For example, 1 gram, 215 grams to 230 grams, achieving the same power, 2 grams. I have spent 2 years in the lab. But to my surprise, when I use hydrogen as a fuel, that is when I change the fuel, whatever I have achieved, 200 grams, 200 horsepower, is getting in 85 grams. Such is the calorific value, the power, you can realize. So, so it is getting ready. You can realize. So thermal efficiency, we are increasing, increasing and we each to a level in a diesel engine around 45%. That means 450 ml I can convert and remaining uh, 550 ml opportunities of innovation. So they went on innovating, innovating. Finally, when they put fuel cell, they are achieving around 800 grams. That is 80%, 80 to 85%. That is the reason, even today, few fuel cell buses are under testing, either at Indian Oil or at Tata or at our place, where that 28 ton truck, which used to give 3 to 3.5 kilometer per liter in fuel cell, is giving 14 kilometer per liter. Such a power. And, okay, so fuel cell research is going on many years, many years. Uh, it is. It will see a day. Then what you will do with the this IC engines. In 2019, I remember all 40 CEOs of Europe, either Audi or Volkswagen or many companies, France, uh, PSA and all, they all told that if you want to reduce CO2, go to diesel engine from petrol, because they know only that at that time. 15% CO2 reduction, petrol to diesel. But suddenly in 2020, everybody turned back to battery, electric vehicle, so that CO2 is zero. But that CO2, somewhere we are spending. Professor, uh, Dr. Sarswood mentioned about Professor Avinash Agarwal's report. It is written that after 1.6 lakh kilometer only you can get zero CO2 because the battery production CO2 to be consumed after 1.6 lakh kilometer. So there are many theories, pros and cons, but everything is accounted. For example, if you get a small battery and if you use for a two-wheeler and it goes for two, three days and again he is charging with your washing machine 15 volt port and he is getting very less uh, charge for the transportation. Customer will himself will choose. 
yesterday my friend Shama was talking to me, if high electric is very costly, how people will afford? I told you, if electric is very cheap, people will go to that without making whatever I am making. So, <laughs> it's a matter of time what will be ready. And even we are thinking that hydrogen also will be cheaper. But these are the hopes. However, science is to be made and overnight you cannot make. That is the reason, even though many people are saying this is the confusing world, what we should make. The confusing world because 90% we are importing. We cannot afford to import 150% energy. So we have to prepare our own energy. Jules Verne, in his, uh, uh, around the day in 80 years, I saw a line called, water will be the coal of future. Now water will be the coal of future, you are seeing today. From water, electrolyzer, split, take hydrogen and use fuel and hydrogen is so powerful. So with this introduction of thermal efficiency and how modern day fuels are emerging, let me touch a few top topics where we are and some combustion topics to justify this and where we are going up to hydrogen. Let me tell Yes. Okay. So our aim is zero crash, that is safety, zero aim, emission and zero congestion. Uh, this is a small engine, 15 years back I have designed, it is 1.5 litre 3 cylinder. In those period, 1.5 litre 3 cylinder is quite common, even Audi designed and everybody were designing. But we designed for a small truck. Today around, uh, this is 100% designed in uh, India and uh, 500,000 engines on the road with all fuels it can be used. Even hydrogen I can try here because it is our own design and uh, zero failure. Also. So can we predict the future? We are saying that today any fuel. So this is I have taken from Toyota. Toyota sir. Yes. Okay. Sorry for the initial hiccup using this instrument. That is a lag when I put it. It takes time to. Not going. You are to leave the company. Again, I have to start my work. Okay, no issue. The matter says that. Toyota, the chairman of Toyota, he says, uh, I can't rely on one fuel. We are not enemy to IC engine. We are enemy to carbon. Can I decarbonize? What are all the variety of decarbonization available? That is what he explores. So, including hybrid, he explores. You know that C18 is our C12 is our diesel and C8 octane is our petrol. So if you go to CH4 natural gas, you already removed many C. However, if you use everything, CO2 is there, but all other pollutants are come down. So doctor was say, uh, saying at that time with IASC when I was trying methanol, when I put 100% methanol, I was getting not zero and the full throttle. So every fuel, plays a role now. The same thing Toyota also experimenting with all the fuel. Of course they say hydrogen fuel cell will be there, but other fuels will coexist. That is what the page is going to say. And uh, from there I have touched upon where are we in India? The, any of slides is not there I can tell. Where are we in India? For example, in 2000, uh, we just talked about emissions. Shall we reduce emissions? And suddenly in Delhi pollution was more <coughs> is, uh, amplified and they said we have to put CNG in Delhi alone. In fact, uh, Tata and uh, even Ashok Leland, they have camped there to put uh, all, convert all the buses to <laughs> CNG. So for CNG was the first transition in the emission and uh, they put CMVR 2000 for all vehicles. Immediately, that means they reduce some 20% emission. Immediately they went into CMVR the 2000, BS1, BS2 and BS3. Before 2010, BS3 is established across India within uh, 8 years. 
can you imagine again within another 10 years we could be a 6 we already all emissions are touching asymptotic curve it's already almost close and uh, we will be okay now this is though this is the reality though this is the reality we improved a lot except for monsoon seasons and uh, because of the iot also we are able to monitor okay so this is what uh, mr trader says cng lng biofuel methanol ethanol hydrogen hydrogen fuel cell all technologies they will explore because they can't predict the future and uh, so we are here but uh, it is not very far away we can service because of iot iot and uh, this is just to show that the zero 6 i told within 10 years we came so this is engine this is after treatment in engine you can say if it is a motorcycle 9000 rpm if it is a passenger car it is 5000 rpm if it is a tractor truck or 2500 rpm maybe railway engine 1000 rpm that means revolutions per minute i have to make the combustion and kill the emission carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen where are these are the chemical reactions are taking place i'll tell you in a simple language in a combustion combustion is nothing just air and fuel is going inside inside we are compressing compressing the air only initially for diesel combustion when it is a gasoline combustion i have to ignite because i have to heat it up so i will use spark plug maybe so slowly temperature will increase how fast rate of reaction and other things are there this temperature then pressure will increase it will pressurize and all those energy will be stored in the flywheel that means we have four stroke mostly in 1990 after four stroke motorcycle everything is four stroke so because of this pressure which is stored in flywheel other three strokes it will operate that means that rpm is 3000 rpm per minute can you imagine and okay even four stroke means 720 degree it will travel but my combustion duration is only 70 degree 10 percent i am getting only 10 percent time so whole slides will have only those pictures 10 percent time uh, 70 degree how much i can control the emission we managed to control the emission up to bs4 by at least using egr as a technology for reducing NOx. and beyond bs4 we couldn't control only in the engine that is why this after treatment get born and this after treatment, I will show you what is in inside the box. Reduces CO, hydrocarbon, NOx and particulate. If it is a gasoline combustion, carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon is more. If it is a diesel combustion, NOx and particulate matter is high. However, in future or even today, all are emission neutral. All emission values are low. So we have to apply different different technologies. What are all the other fuel engines we are using? This is what this says. And just for you to say how this after treatment is managed in one picture, you will understand. Because without which we cannot reach the, the cleaning there. Now, when I was there in 2000, there was a big seminar with Europeans, households, and all in Delhi. The first time same year 2000 discussed with full automobile industry in Vigyan board. At that time, all Europeans were saying, if you want to breathe fresh air, put your nose in Euro 4 vehicle in Europe. That's what he was telling me, the Bosch guys. Now I am telling them, put your nose in Euro 6 of Indian vehicle. You will breathe air. I am cleaning my air. Of course, not up to the level of Dara 2. So, I will, I will keep the target to level of Dara 2 where the quality index or this graphic era university is my target to reduce pollution. That is what it is. So, now you see, when you put DOC, I am just showing the picture. It is just a structure, small hook in a round area and where if gas is passing through, emission is reduced, particulate and here, DOC, then hydrocarbon and CO will reduce. This DOC we are using for past 20 years. I will tell you about the secret of this. Nothing, platinum, palladium or rhodium materials are coated there inside. It is honeycomb structure to have maximum surface area. Most of the chemistry people will appreciate. Surface technology is still working everywhere, surface only. You either strength or this surface technology only. So, 
this is this will reduce hydrocarbon and CO. That is what this dock. Mostly dock is available in all vehicle, either gasoline or diesel. And especially if you want to combat particulate matter, then you may have to use DPF. DPF is nothing but same DOC, but alternate holes plugged just to filter. That means the soot particle won't go out. We will collect here and we will clean it on go. We will clean it on go. That is called as regeneration. We used to suddenly increase the temperature and clean it. By the way, we are combating particulate. That means one other operation. Engine will clean. Then here also we will do regeneration. The NOx will be reduced by a special technology called SCR. In uh, 2005, we may be one truck load of uh, this. This is called as a substrate. Might be imported. Today, maybe some more than 10 to 15 truck loads are getting imported. We have to make a technology for substrate in India also. Of course, sir, of course, sir, metallic substrates are being manufactured in India. This, this ceramic substrate, Cordray, by, by seeing you, I want to make everything in India. So I have to mention this. Yes. Yes. There is no doubt. He was already he already registered for 50 more years of career, you told now. So <laughs> I second by Sudhir, sir. Okay. So you see, sir. So anyhow. So and all those coatings, testology, now even nano coatings are established so that we can nano coating is nothing but you can use the materials very efficiently. One gram of gold when you make it nano particle, it will fill one football ground. That's a surface area and I want only surface chemistry on that. And then after NOx is reduced, we are getting some ammonia. That also will combat with another AC that is additional substrate. It is only platinum coated. So with precious metals, we added the second box. I was showing you the second box. This is what the content of second box. With this, we are meeting Euro 6. Now Euro 7 also will be ready. Further 50% reduction, that is almost zero actually. Everywhere air will be. Here also we can do some innovations. I just put how innovations are being made here. Anyhow, now ice is nice. With all these things, ice is nice. That is my topic. Okay. So affordable energy, uh, Dr. Saswath already told you that affordable energy is required. You fully established for liquid fuels today either logistics or production or transportation and affordability and availability. For alternate fuels also we will be establishing sim similar to that. Till then ICE is nice. Anyhow net zero 2017 is there. So we will be continuing to do this. So my view of saying ICE is nice is we should do more and more research in this area because time is very less, 20 more years. So we have to make it more efficient, more affordable and uh, more CO2 friendly. That is the reason. Uh, these are the challenges we face. Now, today we are in these challenges. CO2 commitments means even Amazon, Flipkart, Geo, Shell, they are asking electric vehicle or they say CO2 zero vehicle. And everybody is committing for net zero today. And large investment in green energy you might be doing, might be taken in paper, either Reliance or Adani or even government, central government going to invest 19,000 crore. And PLI schemes are available for electric and fuel cell. CNG, LNG, we have been using for past 20 years, but slightly because of pricing, it's not policy or pricing. Sometimes uh, we made enough CNG vehicles and we are not getting sold, suddenly CNG prices are increased. Now, Recently, it is reducing. I am sure by 2027, the prices will be normalized both uh, CNG, LNG. So, if we develop efficient vehicles today, it will be more convenient. Where you have already abated the CO, no one C only. But uh, maybe when uh, Saraswat sir is mentioning methanol, I was thinking that CNG you have to carry with uh, 200 bar tanks, long, long, uh, big, big tanks. Instead of that method, it is only methanol, see it for. Convert it and a small tank you carry it, rather than big tank. And <laughs> LNG is nothing but liquid, right? liquid CNG. So, uh, this is what you are saying, market dynamics is there. So, till now we are talking about mass production volume, future it will be a mobility only, it's only value. 
even shared mobility in the first photo I was showing, shared mobility can be possible. Like that, uh, the automobile mission plan also aligned to this, whatever we are saying. And uh, this way you can look into this. That battery will be up to this, up to LC maybe 11, 10. Provided everything is available, affordable there, I'm not saying research is going on in that. For example, even for 16 ton truck, if you want, 3 ton is the battery size today. That is the weight, weight of the battery. Yeah. Huh? Yes, yes, I am not at home. So, it is 3 ton. So, battery weight is there, battery recycling is not uh, on. So, my word of ice is nice is slowly coming here at the background. But however, for a two-wheeler, three-wheeler, maybe, it may be a reality. Long back during pandemic, when you are giving lecture in VAT, sir, I asked you a question. When electric will come? You said that because of pandemic, it may delay to 2032. That two years. That maybe for... And the three-wheeler, these uh, e-rickshaws you might be seeing. No, that is what I was saying, that if it is more affordable, people will pick it uh, on e-rickshaws. And uh, for our trucks, we may go for bigger trucks, 40 ton, 28 ton, fuel cell or hydrogen ice. The hydrogen ice, why hydrogen ice? Today, everything is established for ice. Uh, and so many companies are depending on that. When I said I am running hydrogen engine, many of my suppliers are very happy. They are still thinking that, okay, he has to change everything to EV component. Now there is a life for that, for 20 more years. But hydrogen, sir, definitely zero carbon. We are taking water out of it in our lab, where I have invited sir, sir, he is going to see that on 16. Now, this is only to show that, uh, because uh, soon you should not forget engine design. Any engine, maybe we are using from 1 liter to 8 liter for many application. Any engine design is in this only one formula. Since I came to college, I want to tell you. If you put PLAN by 4500 is horsepower, one formula. That P is the magic. L A is bore and stroke. N is RPM. If it is 9000 RPM, then it's motorcycle. 1000 RPM is uh, 1500 RPM is gen set. 4000. The P is the magic. In the earlier days, in a few slides, I will just pass through. I am telling that. Earlier days, the P was 8.58. It's a bar, 8 bar pressure. That's a number. So we used to use naturally aspirated where no emission error. Then it slowly migrated to 10.5, then again 30, now today even 25. One challenge was given for uh, these UAV vehicles. They want lightweight but high power. 123 kg, 175 also. So they are at all very high BMP, that is, uh, I will say that 50 or 55 kilowatt per liter, like that uh, requirement. So, this one formula, anybody can take challenge. With one formula, you can design any engine. Once, because bore stroke is available here, which will fix the total dimension of the engine. And the P decides the fuel injection. And the air flow, air fuel ratio. If it is a gasoline engine or any of the fuel, it is stoichiometric ratio. Stoichiometric is 14 is to 1 for gasoline. And maybe for ethanol, it is 17 is to 1 because more oxygen. Is. Hydrogen it may be 29 is one, and when it is diesel, we are operating lean, so 20, 21 is one and 18 is one. So, PLA, just to tell you that with one formula we can design an engine. And by putting a spark plug in a diesel engine, like this, this is a diesel engine, injector and bore. Putting a spark plug, you can use any fuel. <laughs> Only you have to adjust the component ratio. It's just to show how we are making alternate fuel. Okay, so let me take few combustion topic. Combustion is nothing but burning a fuel. Burning a fuel in a controlled environment. I don't know, ballistic and uh, other missiles. One is controlled and one is trajectory. Here also we try to control. That is uncontrolled only. So that's why he told that in combustion he studied spray and all. So you see how spray makes the magic, injector makes the magic. So he, today it is electronic control. Since 2005, we are using common rail combustion, everything is 32 bit computer. So, the injection start we can control, not the end. The duration is controlled only by quantity and the energy. So, we will be just uh, going through these topics. Uh, so, it's too much now. 
So I'll just say air flow, fuel flow, combustion chamber, component ratio, spray hole geometry, diesel quality, rail pressure, injection time. So much struggle is there on the left hand side to get very good performance, very good emission and low CO2 and noise also. In the combustion, I'll tell you the first time when I did common rail engine in Tata Motors, I just converted Tata 407 engine to common rail because I have to make a passenger car engine for Safari. Safari die car was my project there. So at the time it is very interesting. Noise reduction is being talked. Then when I put common rail engine inside the track and I could see trrr, very, very low noise. Earlier it was mechanical. Then only I realized the mechanical injection itself giving 20 decibel more noise than common rail, the electronic, because of the rail shaping and combustion. So if you want to truly realize combustion, you should have that era where mechanical and common rail together are available. Today everything is common rail. So you have much more challenge to reduce noise today. Uh, so the trade is and to meet target performance and to meet stringent emission, low CO2, low cost, higher thermal efficiency. And this is the combustion concept what I was telling. That this is the bowl for uh, diesel engines. And here normally pen proof design is for gasoline engine. However, if fuel is injected, it's getting burned how fast. And I can show you here this though. You are able to see this though. So this is the pressure crank angle diagram. The area under this we are getting the power and uh, NOx is reducing if the temp, if we retard, if you do late combustion. If you do late combustion, NOx is reducing, but soot is increasing. There is a compromise. So, here I, I want to clearly explain here, that's why I put it here. You could see start of combustion and end of combustion. So, I told you combustion duration is 70 degree, not more than that. And heat release, if you see this is TDC, 50% of the heat release, if you see, it's around 18 degree, 20 degree. And uh, heat release rate, how fast it is going, then NOx will increase with, with respect to X filling. And this is the spray study which uh, Dr. Saraswat was saying. This I took it from Combustion Engine Development Worker Springer. Just to say inside what is happening, even we ourselves are very difficult using laser Doppler velocimeter, we should do it. But however, we used to think how it is. Today, combustion we are doing by changing input parameter by measuring out parameter, not measuring inside what is happening. Just for the picture I have taken. But if it is wet combustion, it will be like this, it is dry combustion. And uh, flame propagation, I told, this is, you see, when it is a gasoline, it starts from pet, uh, spark plug and it is going like this. If it is diesel, everywhere it is getting composed. Now, okay, this is uh, too much initial remixed and pre-mixed and all this is a combustion study. But I can tell you, in gasoline engine or even in hydrogen or even in uh, CNG, wherever spark ignition is used, you will have pre-ignition and knocking, how it looked like in the hydrogen. Okay, so we passed through so many era from Euro 1 to Euro 6 today by only changing technologies. What are all the technologies? Initially, I introduced you to the after treatment technology. I told how we are reducing emission. In, or in cylinder technology, we use turbocharger and EGR. We use EGR and turbocharger. Exhaust gas recirculation. So these are a few pictures how we crossed to earlier years. And here I wanted you to concentrate that over the period cylinder in cylinder pressure we are increasing. Over the period. By way of change of technology also we are able to increase the pressure. The advantage I want to tell you that I want to save energy. Now I have only two technology which is working very well. One is higher peak pressure and higher peak pressure you can achieve by advancing. Advancing to some extent. By advancing, you are getting time for combustion. You are burning and getting the power. Whenever you advance, you are getting better 
fuel efficiency, better thermal efficiency. So peak pressure increase is must for advancing. But when you advance, NOx will increase. That I will do it in after treatment in today's technology. So for fuel economy, best technology is advancing. And for NOx reduction, I can use some EG, EGR. Then again, SCR. So advancing is one technology. So for that, the peak pressure increase is a must. Or if you advance, peak pressure will increase. And so strength of the engine to be taken care of peak pressure. So over the period of the emission, I could see I started with 85 bar peak pressure. Today I am in 200 bar peak pressure. So peak pressure is increasing. Next one, injection pressure. That is, uh, when fuel injection when we use, we started with uh, 600 bar pressure and today we are in 2000 bar pressure. And again, when you say fuel efficiency, by increasing is to I'm getting fuel efficiency less and fuel conservation is important for me. This is a summary of some combustion insights, I think. Uh, this is only to say whatever I have told today, I just, it is written here, advance the timing is increasing the peak pressure and it is better for fuel efficiency and uh, this is the heat release rate. In a summary I can show you when all the three fuels, how the heat release rate is effective. So when I use a small, here I am using a smaller engine that is downsized. When I use downsized also to get a power I have to increase the peak firing pressure. That is what it is true. So I am using a downsized engine to get the same power that is four cylinder in place of six cylinder. It is more fuel efficient. And uh, that is what this describes. When I compare four cylinder with respect to six cylinder, I am getting more efficiency, improving the efficiency for the same OS power. Okay. So uh, today we tried everything, means uh, electronic engine and EGR wall. EGR wall is nothing but just take an exhaust and give it to inside. For example, 10 percent, if you give, 10 percent won't participate in the combustion. It is inert. However, it plays with the heat transfer, reduces the temperature, at least it will attack directly, like a missile, it will attack directly the NOx formation. Automatically NOx will reduce. So 7% EGR reduces 25% NOx. Long back I worked with Professor Parikh, uh, I, can, I think I can remember here, she she's not that fast. Sir, uh, it is not there because of EGR. Now I will tell you why it is not there. Why I will tell you why it is not there. Over the period, because of NOx reduction, people are retarding. I am using this to advance. Uh, no, by by combating NOx by EGR, I am advancing. That is the reason. Already I am having excess air. I am removing only this 10% excess air. Yes, yes. Before using IoT only. 
and uh, we have duty cycle testing. We don't test a lot now. We'll, we have prediction testing and we have minimum duty cycle testing for confirmation. And uh, we, we now practice to handle this fuel, diesel, CNG, hydrogen, gasoline, methanol, ethanol, biodiesel, blends, DME and high We did a DST project with uh, IIT Delhi on 30% uh, dimethyliter uh, track, mini track. And uh, we work with uh, Delphi or Bosch or Denso, Westport, Woodward, Standard & Motorball, all fuel injection supplies. However, today we practice to take the control system in our control. That is the electronics, uh, software is ours and hardware we procure from them. Uh, they, that way only you can do your innovations and pattern. And uh, so this is just to say what are all the technologies we are handling. We also have many calibration tools. It's not easy. But we can train very fast. And with this, we achieved this in diesel combustion. We achieved this in gaseous combustion. Uh, right now, I'm designing a one liter, three cylinder gasoline engine, but it can be used for multi-fuel. It's a recently for a sub two ton truck. So recently it is being designed. So there, I will take care of these points. Now, I want to tell only the new combustion which is being explored. HCCA and RCCA. Of course, uh, Professor Ravi Krishna is there. HCCA, it was a project done by Professor Ravi Krishna and uh, okay, where I could able to reduce 150 ppm NOx even in cylinder. Of course, you have to pre-mix the fuel, uh, the same fuel, then it is HCCA. That is, you have to have a pre-mixed uh, combustion, air and fuel mixed and fuel. And when it is RCCA, it is a different fuel. So RCCA is a different fuel. That is, uh, uh, for example, methanol and diesel. We used to send methanol fuel. Uh, first we will start with diesel. Then we used to send methanol fuel before suction stroke so that it will get evaporated and it will burn. So like that we are able to do 50% methanol and 50% diesel. So both the combustion are to be yet explored under research. and. Uh, by the way, we are doing all this fuel in this. Mm. You could see, we have done, uh, in fact, when I was in Tata Motor, I have run around 40 buses with uh, B20 diesel fuel, with the biodiesel in those days. It was there. But, so, biodiesel, if it is available, then also it is compatible. And recently, with Indian oil, Ashok Lin buses ran for 18% hydrogen and CNG. That is, high thing, 50 buses ran that. So, that means what I am saying is, Composition is burning of fuel, burning efficiently, compact emissions, then any fuel you can do it, today technology is available. That is the simple sentence and research opportunity is huge. Technology is available, but you have a huge research opportunity, it's not that it is seen. This, is, this will summarize my presentation. I'll just show you. So this is what combustion engineers, uh, you can say that this is their chart. Where if you see it is diesel combustion, this is hydrogen combustion, this is CNG combustion. Where again the duration is this. We try to increase the duration by pilot injection and post injection. We tried our level best, but we are not able to do that. So this is a big area of opportunity. The rule is if you make this like this rectangle, then you can get more power with less fuel. But still research is possible. Like you know, whenever common rail is being introduced, they used to say, if it is injected, the combustion will be straight, but it's not straight, it's like this. Only. Anyhow, so now any fuel I am comfortable because within the diesel curve it is there. That means the validation I can do within the diesel curve, diesel is already there for more than 100 years. And now I will tell you about hydrogen. Because few slides hydrogen, because right now we are trying, I thought that I will introduce you making an hydrogen infrastructure, running an hydrogen engine, if it is 10 years back, it is difficult for India. Even 2005, I ran at IIT Madras because of the core project and it is a DST funded combustion project and Ratan Tata also gave one crore for that project. We ran one year hydrogen, how to handle and how to do combustion. It was not sustained at the time. Today, there is a sustenance in there because there is a customer for that. 
we also sold some 24 hour hydrogen vehicles that is running for testing and everybody including government all are here only the collaboration is there we used to say that today competing people are collaborating there is no competition there we have to collaborate for bringing the technology for the nation so um, we we got a backfire we got a pressure wave this all the experience then next day we will modify the composition we will learn today in the world hydrogen is being researched we are in phase with that earlier what will happen if it is zero six they will say there is a technology available somewhere you bring it here it's not like that today so hot you can learn yourselves today is the technology parallelly developed with us as well in fact many of the people visited our lab for learning this and so we studied this that fire by using this all these principles we iterating everything today we are running engine without backfire it's not easy to run hydrogen because of the hydrogen property the property of flammability is 4 to 72 so anywhere slight and low ignition energy is required and developing an ignition system is difficult in hydrogen you require more energy for fuel injection same you require low spark that way it is, and without spark also you can't do it. So we did some backfire analysis and we are successful. Sir, uh, it is easy when we do the backfire analysis. What we did was we put ten thermocouples in the intake manifold. And if there is a backfire, suddenly intake manifold temperature will go to 600 like exhaust So this is our Deshi method we found out. We didn't go for any sensors to find a backfire. We just put a temperature sensor and, so. and easily today and we put a camera also. If there is a knocking immediately, camera and speaker. So if you put a knocking, automatically the speaker will tell you. There is a knock, then immediately we see the temperature and we'll come. So and we put interlocks also. Now. So these are some of the things. Okay. Though we could see in the computer, but response time will be different by seeing. So automatically we put interlocking for backfire. Switch up the engine, that's the only thing. Uh, so we are doing this optimization right now. Maybe in a year's time we will run full fledged. Okay, so I will just tell you summary of learning till now on hydrogen. Why I took hydrogen summary of line, I think it will give confidence for others to run as experiment also. That's the main reason I took hydrogen, because all other fuels we are running. Hydrogen also. Now there is no starting difficulty in hydrogen, just it starts. And uh, BSFC, I told you it's one third, only it's consuming. And the cost of hydrogen, other than green hydrogen, is cheaper. Cheaper means it's not much cheaper, 500 rupees per kg, or even 350 per kg, you were saying. Otherwise, earlier green hydrogen I tested for 1000 rupees per kg, I couldn't find any difference in IC engine as of now. So, uh, so, and here one more, air flow requirement is twice in hydrogen. You have to run lambda equal to 2. When lambda equal to 2, NOx is 0. So, that means that 2 lambda is maintaining the temperature, avoiding the NOx formation. And the control system here helps 2 to 2.3 window you have to control. Then NOx is zero in that window. And uh, 7 to 10 percent EGR we gave. That also for NOx reduction so that NOx is 99 percent down. And you need not use SCR for hydrogen also. I want to avoid using ammonia for that. And uh, steam formation in the exhaust. Any combustion engineer used to see black smoke or black. Even for CNG, everywhere tailpipe will be lightly black. Hydrogen is running for past one year, fully white, no black. And you could see water coming out. Steam is flowing, even running hydrogen vehicles. And uh, NOx engine is sensitive to lambda. Spark plug, I told you, spark timing and spark plug. And the combustion rate we have seen, same. 50% of uh, mass burn fraction is again 18 degree, 18 degree after TDC. And uh, I'll take go, uh, I'll take go. Uh, these are all already uh, discussed. Uh, okay, I will come back to methanol now. From hydrogen, I'm just changing to other fuel. And uh, in methanol in the MD15, we have observed that 
slightly drop in combustion pressure because your calorific value is just 50 percent. So the science should show that in 50 percent, the 3 percent drop in power only. Even whenever we are uh, driving vehicles, I have shown once duty cycle operation, I could see all operations will complete in 80 percent maximum. So refining 20 percent is just for acceleration. That acceleration also not always required in few times overtaking. Hence, uh, methanol, that 3% drop is not affecting. That is what we are testing vehicles now. But you should back up with this theory, otherwise uh, we are not able to confidently say how it is working. That's why we took this research on methanol. Uh, <laughs> dimethyl ether also similar way. And this I wanted to tell you. With respect to RPM, power will increase. So, the peak pressure also increasing with respect to RPM. That way it is. Uh, finally, what happened? You make an engine and engine is running. Engine is running means two things will happen. When engine is running, because of torque, it will rotate on its own. So, you require mounts to mount it on any vehicle to avoid this rotation based on the torque. Number two, where the heat distribution will go. Hence, you should understand. So, when I talk to thermal efficiency, this is similar to that. 35% thermal efficiency means the remaining 65%, 50% will go to exhaust or 40% will go to exhaust, remaining 30% will go to coolant. So, if we improve, for example, that's what we did. In the exhaust, we are turbocharging it. Us using the exhaust, we are running a turbine. And that compresses the air and sending more air for this. That's what turbocharging. That means that gives 5% fuel economy for me. How I am utilizing the exhaust while expanding. Then if I use turbo compounding, again 2% I will get it. Same way, uh, if I do faster warm-up, instead of waiting for warm-up from 80 degree, if I faster warm-up, quick, faster warm-up and quicker combustion will give you better fuel economy. So by the way, I have to manage that heat balance curve. So managing the heat balance curve is another way of making thermal efficiency. That's why I just uh, introduced this here. HCCI I explained to you already, and RCCI also I do. Now, zero impact emission IC engine. Okay, we call when we go to hydrogen, it will have zero impact for emission. Switch to hydrogen. But hydrogen, before hydrogen, what is the path? Even methanol may be the path. Because I told you, you know, in methanol, zero NOx is coming, is full throttle. And methanol is an hydrogen carrier. We are working towards zero impact on emission. That is why many places, low carbon fuels, people are talking about e-fuels in 2035. Sarah was saying CCUs. So taking that CO2, making a fuel. And original fuel, if it is biofuel, then we can say totally we have done the circular economy. That's what we will be doing next research in that. Biofuel from waste, biomass, where your favorite. Now I say he is already standing. Yesterday only we are talking. I just asked him, what you will do with the leather waste? I am making fuel. I said, I am not going to use that fuel, I will test. And he is ready to make any fuel now with that leather waste. So it is a boom to India now. We have such scientists So this, I do not want to too much. It must be an advertisement cycle where I see engineers present EV and I want to go through this. However, both has pros and cons. If you go to two-wheeler, maybe easy for uh, electric. If you go to heavy vehicle, it's definitely not easy. Uh, that way it is. But if fuel cell is coming, it is efficient. Means you require electric vehicle also. Because it is called as fuel cell electric vehicle. It is not fuel cell. That I will show you. Okay? This is only to show. This says the summary of that page. So that's why I didn't read that page. So it is depending on that, what is your choice, where you are combating emission, tailpipe or another place. Okay. So there are some grid losses people are talking. I am saying that these are the constraints what they are talking. I am sure scientists can find a solution. Even recycling of battery, carrying of battery, everywhere we can find a solution. Some range anxiety is there. Today also range anxiety is there. So range anxiety is there, but I want to mention one thing. We have been using CNG. Our range is maximum 350 to 500, maximum 500 kilometer. 
and the LNG, if you use, it will be around double, maybe 700 to 800 kilometer. But the problem with the LNG is you can't keep the vehicle idle. It boils off, fuel boils off. And while it boils off, the low end fuels are eating. So it is giving misfire knocking again. So handling LNG we are experiencing, but I am not concluding. Because in Russia, they are handling LNG a lot. Then I could observe that they are using smaller LNG tanks. So before evaporation, they fill it again. So these are all we are learning. So that is on the LNG and CNG. So that way it is. So for sustainable mobility solution, it will become part of our life and everybody will try to use everything and use it depending on the country. Today LNG also coming, you could see a few trucks are in LNG also, CNG also available, hydrogen we are experimenting, electric trucks on demand. In my village all the garbage trucks are electric only. In Chennai cities, electric only, small trucks, all garbage trucks. I don't know they are managing. Till now, whatever is running, no truck is stopping there. Even electric buses yesterday we saw here and today also. That means all fuels for sustainable mobility. This is only to show how many engines we developed, what application, and more so we are exporting also. Because of export, I got a chance to work on Euro 5 because India, Euro 4 and Euro 6. Uh, Russia and Ukraine wants Euro 5. Now Gulf also wants Euro 5. So. This is only to show so many applications are there in IC engines. In defense vehicle, in fact, uh, VFJ factory, we are the approved supplier for VFJ, as well as now new defense application. For example, I gave 450 Aspor bridge launcher for defense, 50 Aspor. And in defense, always I used to go and say that, sir, you don't require emission, and they asked me BS6. And I tried to prove, even military of USA is BS1. Now they agreed for BS3. <laughs> Otherwise, they want BS6 because they use the same vehicle after some time in the land. That's what they say. Maybe for school buses. And this is off road. Off road also now emissions came. So, SCR technology again it came. So, it's a boon for us. Because SCR, till now off road was unorganized sector. Now it's organized sector because emission came. So, we supply engines to everybody, almost caterpillar, glass and uh, CNH, Case New Holland. So it, now it will be reverse time. Everybody will take engine from me. So, this is also pressurizes us to do partner network from our side. Because all these technologies, if you make yourself, if you drive your own car, you need not pay the driver. So we have to make ourselves. And uh, this is uh, only to say how the after treatment system looks for diesel and looks for CNG or any alternate fuel. It's a three-way cat car. This is a bigger size with all these things packed. And now finally, if you remove the engine, this is the engine, say hydrogen engine. If you remove the engine and put a battery, then it is electric vehicle. If you remove, if you keep the battery, add a fuel cell, then it is fuel cell electric vehicle. Otherwise, our vehicle is same, I'll just show you. You see that for making it other than diesel, I have to change only seven systems. All the vehicles available in India, already, you know, want to this, we can do retrofitment also by changing this system. Engine, engine definitely you should change because those are all old engine, don't refurbish, it's better if it is CNG engine tested or hydrogen engine tested or electric battery already tested. Then change electricals, definitely electricals will change for mating. Then fuel system will change depending on the fuel system. For example, methanol track when we launched it. In the fuel system, I put a fuel pump for methanol to cube. Otherwise, the engine is same as CNG, no different. SAR wants me to use compression efficient till now or high compression ratio. Get to do that anyway. So, ECU definitely because all are ECU controlled. And the frame just to attach the respective fuel boxes. And uh, exhaust system definitely three way cat car. Other than that, the vehicle is weak. Only we can work on lightweight material. So this gives hope that we can make fuel agnostic engines. And these are all the trends. Maybe the trends will go on change depending on the investments and economy. And here it says that electric vehicle suitable for buses. And anyhow, because it is a shared service, the cost may be easy in many places. 
now I am not hearing any charging problem, so I am not able to say anything on electric buses. This picture says commercial vehicle buses will go to electric, trucks will go to fuel cell electric. These are all some agreements and energy consumption, energy we talked already, and energy consumption is more increasing. So it is for us to conserve energy. And this will be, look like year 2020, I am working on IC engines for bus and truck and CNG. And now I will work for electric also lightly started. Now I will work for all. So future will look like use of all fuels. So maybe some people say that we are confused, we are in mixed mode. Nothing to be done. As a scientist, we should work on all so that one by one we will get evolved depending on the affordability. So what we aim is zero accident, zero emission and always on. That means any time we are able to use and low cost of ownership. And uh, I will tell you this. You might have heard about Olympics. Olympics is once in four years. For combustion engineers like us, Olympics is every moment because I have to work on fuel efficiency. If I work on fuel efficiency, if emission is reduced, again I have to work on that. Then again safety in cost effective and innovation. So for us, Olympics is always there. Every moment Olympics, not once in four years. With this, I will say a big thanks to you. And this, uh, it will run, sir? I hope so. Can you run this? Boss, this I will say a big thanks for the opportunity whatever you have given to me. I am very much uh, indebted to sir. I don't know. Thanks for this opportunity. There is no sound. Though I was nervous, so you sat here and took me to possible trouble. Thank you. Hydrogen instead of diesel. A strong carbon fiber composite cylinder ensures safe storage and high pressure endurance of up to 350 bar. That's extremely easy to install, lightweight, and maintenance free. With minor changes to our H series six cylinder internal combustion engine, we are able to deliver power and torque equivalent to a conventional engine. With a lean combustion strategy, it ensures minimal emissions and less noise, resulting in an efficient, cleaner, and a quiet drive. The hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicle delivers the highest payload and long range. Its aggregates are similar to a diesel vehicle, aiding easier maintenance, all while complementing the hydrogen mission that supports the Atmanirbhar Bharat initiative. These benefits make hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicles a perfect vehicle to drive us towards the future. A short limit, Kuimansi, Dune. Personally, thanking you all for patient listening. I took more time, maybe one hour. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. There are any questions we have time for only two questions if we have any or if we have one here. Sir, but in 
today's world, electric vehicles are gaining more popularity. So, sir, according to you, if you had to choose one, uh, what would be the future? Electric vehicles, engines working on water? Don't, don't or zero in my lecture. I thought that I communicated. No issue. I will tell you now. For all application engineers, they know what is going to come. For all newspaper readers, electric is the future. It is how it is managed by the media. I was also telling that in 2018, the whole European CEOs were saying that if you want to reduce CO2, go to diesel. Suddenly in 2020, they discovered that $100 per kilowatt hour battery will come, so it will be affordable, so I'll go to electric. So it's not like that. The energy requirement is increasing like anything. So you will have a combination of fuel. Handling electric, using electric, may be convenient in two-wheeler or three-wheeler maximum, which is already, it is getting established on its own because of affordability, beyond which research is going on. All fuels will coexist. Ultimately, fuel cell electric vehicle it, for 28 ton, 49 ton logistic supply may come if thermal efficiency is very good. I was telling that a 28 ton truck will give 14 kilometer per kg when you use hydrogen where diesel if used 3 km per litre. Depending on that, it will come. It's so all belonging to micro and macro economics. So it is not that one fuel will be existing. That is what I am saying. It's not electric. So it is for us to bring everything affordable. You have a lot of research point here. So enthusiastically work on IC and you will get it. Thank you, sir. Now we have one more screen there. We can have that question. This will be the last question. Yes, sir. sir, if you talk about hydrogen as a fuel, we have two options right now. One is hydrogen conversion and one is fuel cell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now if we take one kg mass by mass hydrogen and we utilize it, we use it as conversion and it fuel cell, which is more efficient? Which gives fuel cell is efficient. I have been telling fuel cell, if fuel cell will give 14 km per kg, ice engine will give 9 km per kg. So the second part of the question is, uh, we know that after combustion and even after fuel cell, what we get is steam. If we cool it down, when we did it to liquid form, and then again dissociate it into hydrogen oxygen, can that hydrogen be again used for the further energy production and propulsion? Mm, it is possible. I don't know technology. It will be costly again to work on that technology. Only one thing similar to that I will tell you. Now, hydrogen is not easily carryable on a vehicle. We require 350 bar tank and similar length. Some research is going on. Benzene mixed with the hydrogen in a tank, say 600 liter. So it can be carried. Then there will be a reformer, hydrogen reformer, chemical reformer. So this benzene mixed with hydrogen will pass through that. At a particular temperature, hydrogen will be separated, given for combustion, and this uh, benzene will be recollected. Like, how electrolyte is recollected in the aluminum air battery, such research is going on. There is a chance with the amount of water and separation that is different. Anyhow, water splitting electrolyzer getting hydrogen is. So, it may not be in near future. A day, somebody will think like you. Bring a technology, then we'll use it. So, I can tell you about this. The solid oxide fuel cells will be coming today. They will be working on a mixture of methanol and water. And ultimately, you will produce methanol, uh, sorry, uh, uh, hydrogen, and then water. You take that hydrogen, you do not use it for anything else, convert it into water and feed it back to the time of time it goes. But the efficiency of H2 plus O2, again, is going to be demanding energy again. So that is a major problem. Net energy balance will not be positive. Sir, but if we use some other source to provide that electricity, for example, if we provide solar panels on the roof of the car, and while, while moving, we charge the solar panels and then use that electricity to dissociate water. Is that a feasible solution? No, that is what everybody is doing today for production of hydrogen, solar energy or wind energy is one of the source. But uh, the problem there is the on a mobile system, hydrogen, uh, the mounting it to the, the solar panels and then producing hydrogen and then running that is Again, with the vagary of that time, you got to have a huge story. So that's why now always we have people who are talking of hybrid systems, where when the power from the solar energy is not available. 
will use battery as a constant. That's why the hybrid vehicles are coming today. But when you will use the fuel cell vehicles, the fuel cell vehicles will have that advantage because fuel cell runs on a particular fuel. It can be water, it can be methanol, it can be any, um, even methane, solid oxide fuel. So you can fill it like any other tank and you have no range, range anxiety. But in the case of solar energy, in the case of battery, you have these range anxieties. Thank you, sir. So you can keep that in mind. I think more questions are taken. <laughs> more questions are taken. Yeah, I have Any other question? You can get my email ID from Dr. Shyam also. You can contact me. Yes, sir. Although yes, sir. we don't have time for it, but I think there's one question. Yeah. Because it is a normal lecture, you should encourage them. Otherwise, they say, no, absolutely, I can't come to you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So my name is Dr. Yashwir Singh. So as we know that we are working on the, the alternative fuels like hydrogen, methanol, to use them in a vehicle. I suppose we are using this uh, hydrogen fuel in a vehicle, then uh, hydrogen is having a very toxicity to uh, combine with oxygen, and it may corrode. The parts of the uh, uh, the parts of the like the, in the pistons and the cylinder, it will also do the wear. So, what do you think about the possibilities of uh, the how? We that is what the research we are doing now. Either hydrogen embrittlement is happening, or corrosion is coming. For example, the water condensation will be there in the, in the oil. So, what we are doing is we are re-giving the closed crankcase ventilation. At the time, the condensation effect is less because crankcase temperature is high. Water will condense only at a particular temperature, so we are keeping it warm. And uh, most of the water droplet, if it is an oil, we are modifying the oil additive such a way that with this lubricity is available. So we are working on that. After endurance test, I may answer your question. Definitely, these are the boundary conditions considered for the oil. Yes. Oil has solved all the problems of handling hydrogen compatibility of hydrogen with materials in the rocket ring. Yes. From last 70 years, there are rocket engines working on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Even our own India, we have our own liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engine operating. So what are doubts we have about compatibility, corrosion, storage, transportation, and even combustion of hydrogen with oxygen? The kind of problem which uh, Dr. Krishnan was talking of backfire has been solved in the rocket engines maybe in 1960s. They used to have the same problem. In the injector, the whole thing will backfire. And then there are solutions that are identified because of the flame speeds and things like that. So if we take all that which is available in the rocket propulsion into the IC engine, I think 80% of your research problem can be solved. Thank you. So the way our country is progressing on the uh, rapid production of uh, alternative fuels, methanol, ethanol, biodiesel, bioethanol, dimethyl ether, ethane, all of these fuels. But I feel what the research you have been carrying out on the heat transfer, mass transfer, and energy transfer on the thermal conversion efficiency together. I think we need a multi-fuel research institute or research center uh, to fulfill the need of our uh, aim of the country uh, to make it uh, the rapid production of hydrogen uh, production now. And uh, will you be able to fulfill in a period of five years or six years of our country's funding uh, of coming the hybrid electric vehicle? It is possible. It is possible. Yeah. 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 It was uh, deeply insightful. I'm sure the students have enjoyed it a lot. I'll request you to be on stage, sir. I would like to call upon Honorable Vice Chancellor Graphic University, Professor Sanjay Jaswala. Please express our gratitude towards Dr. Krishnan.
for his fantastic lecture by presenting him with a memento of our appreciation. for making all of this possible. He's taking the short route. You guys are still waiting. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for PK Pandey. And also be calling on the other esteemed guests uh, to express our gratitude towards them as well. Starting with, uh, if I can have Dr. P. Shanmugam on stage please. He's been an avid listener, very good contributor in terms of questions as well. Maybe we'll have him as a speaker sometimes. We conducted the lecture yesterday as well. Big round of applause ladies and gentlemen for Dr. P. Shanmugam. S. Ayangar, uh, Principal Scientist at NAL Bangalore on stage now, please. I know it's been a long morning for you guys. Please keep the applause going. Dr. Venkat S. S. Ayangar, Principal Scientist at NAL Bangalore. Thank you so much, sir, for your gracious presence. Next, I'd like to call upon Professor Dr. Sudarshan Kumar, Head of Department Aerospace Engineering, IIT Bombay. You've been very patiently listening from the third row. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Professor Sudarshan. Professor S. A. Chandiwala, if I can have you over on stage, sir. Former Professor and Head, Department of Mechanical Engineering, SASB and IT Surat. Dr. Sudarshan, uh, he had reminded me that he is not the HOD anymore, but. <laughs> uh, Professor E. Porpatham, can I have you on stage, please, sir? He's the Director, Department of Automotive Engineering at VIT Well Law. <laughs> Dr. V. Ramanujachari, Fellow CSIR, former Director, DRDO, IT Madras Innovation Center. Please join hands in welcoming him on stage. Big thank you from us, sir, for making it all the way and coming down here. Last but not the least, in the celebration of the good times, we have Professor R. V. Ravi Krishna, <laughs> Professor of Department of Mechanical Engineering, ISC Bangalore. He was also a very good singer, he started off with this.
fact, I can also request all the technicians, all the esteemed guests, to join us on stage for a quick group photograph before that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, before we come for the photograph, I think we thanked, all of us thanked all of us, right? We thanked everyone. But one person, I forgot to mention the name, who are behind the scene, who worked yes. all this, was Dr. Joshi. Yes. 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 Joshi. Had he not contacted, not even contacted, he followed me, he followed me almost like six months. Six months. It was like he was following with me almost like six months that when are you, you know, when are you coming here? And because of my lack of, you can say, coordination with Dr. Saswat that we are not able to find exact timing and give him the time. But give you a big round of applause for you. And I support and all the Deciding this setup, please, everyone. Okay. side as well, where our backs are facing the audience, opens up to you to a bigger picture, yeah? Yeah, can we have the photographers? <coughs> Do you want them to stand on stage or meet you? Also, you've uh, been here for so long, we'll request you to stand up and be a part of the picture. Yeah, the ones at the back, you can come down here, right at the front. Please be a part of the picture here. <laughs> Girls, you can come in here. Same. Join Graphic Era deemed to be University Dehradun ranked amongst the top 55 universities of India by NIRF 2023 and amongst top 300 to 400 engineering institutions in the world by Times Higher Education Washington DC with exceptional placement records. Graphic Era, transforming dreams into reality. At the count of three. One, two, three.